Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kamla Rampasada Silva, Chief Executive Officer of the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, our first uh, on our procurement series for this year, 2023. To those of you who are new or joining us for the first time, I want to share that the Caribbean Corporate Governance Institute is a nonprofit membership organization. And we welcome everyone who wishes to join us in our purpose of improving corporate governance practices in the region. We have lots of exciting events and activities planned for this year, including our lessons from the boardroom series, our CCGI conversations with series, and a new series on the role of the board, along with a wide range of workshops. In two days' time, we have the first of our conversations with Therese, and we feature Dr. Maryam Abdul-Richards, who will deliver on the topic, Managing in Disruption. This is an area in which she has great expertise, as she was a part of our medical team, which helped our country successfully battle the COVID-19 crisis. She also has a range of board experiences in both the private and public sector, so she will have quite a bit to share from a governance perspective. On Friday, we have a global leader from South Africa, Janita John, who will deliver a workshop on the effectiveness of the audit committee. Then on Thursday, February 16th, we feature the first of our role of the board series by looking at the role of the chairman and ask, are you ready for the role? This will be facilitated by our own CCGI member, Siron Bailey from here in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, our signature event, Governance Week, will be held from June 25th to 30th. And our team for this week, for this year is a circular world governing for future generations. We are delighted to share that the opening keynote will be delivered by Nandi Mandela, who is the granddaughter of Nelson Mandela. So I invite you to visit our website for details on these and other events, which have been opened up for registration. Now, as CCGI grows, we will be inviting our members to be more involved in the activities of the Institute. Today, I would like to invite one of our very active members, Simone Francois Wittier, who will share the opening remarks with me this morning. She will now share a few housekeeping announcements before introducing our chairman, who will serve as moderator for today. Simone, over to you. Many thanks, Kamla. I am honored to play an active role in the development of the CCGI. As Kamla said, we do have a few housekeeping announcements before we begin the panel discussion. So we would like to start by inviting you to feel free to put on your videos so that we can see each other to engage fully in the session. Also, please ensure that your name is correctly captured on your screen. Uh, we are in a virtual room together and this allows us to have access and to engage freely with the other participants. So we'd like to ensure that everyone is easily identifiable. Also, we would like everyone to keep their microphones muted throughout the session. During the presentations, if you wish to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand using the icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you would need to unmute yourself and then press the mute icon again as soon as you're done in order to minim minimize any disruptive noises. You may also ask um, comments or, sorry, make comments or ask questions in the chat during the session as well. And those of you who need to earn CPDs or PDUs as part of your ongoing certification may use these sessions in order to claim these points. To do so, however, you need to send an email request to info at caribbeangovernance.org. We would need to verify your registration and attendance before issuing the certificate with the CPD hours. And finally, we will put a survey link towards the end of the session and we would appreciate it if you could take two minutes and give us your feedback, please. This is important for us to plan and ensure that we meet your needs. As Kamla said earlier, today is the start of our procurement series. And as such, we look back at the off report, which emanated from the Commission of Inquiry into the construction sector in 2010. We wish to express sincere appreciation to Professor John Ock, who regretted that he could not participate in today's panel discussion and instead recommended a tenured law and procurement specialist, Michael Bauscher, KC from the UK. 
Mr. Bausha is joined with or joined by John Dowes from Canada and Trinidad and Tobago's own Afro Raymond. It is now my pleasure to briefly introduce the CCGI's chairman, Nigel Romano, who will take over and introduce the speakers. He will also serve as the moderator for today's session. Mr. Romano is one of the five founding members of the CCGI. He took over the role as chairman in January of 2020 and helped us successfully navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Romano is a chartered accountant with extensive experience in public accounting and banking across the globe. He was a BSc in Management Studies and an MSc in Accounting from the University of the West Indies, as well as an MBA from the Jack Welch Management Institute. Before joining more Trinidad and Tobago, he was the Managing, managing Director and CEO of GMMB Bank TNT Limited. He's currently the Chairman of the National Flower Mills Limited, the UE Development and Endowment Fund, and the Coover Medical Multi-Training Facility Limited. You may read his full profile, which is in the agenda that was sent to you this morning. So once again, we welcome all of you, and I hand over to Mr. Romano to take over today's panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, just some housekeeping. I'm no longer the chairman of the CMMF or the UE Development and Endowment Fund, so let's correct that. I'm also Thank chairman you. of NIPDEC, which of course was featured in the Off Report, and I serve on the board of the Answer Merchant Bank. So without further ado, let me welcome my distinguished panelists. Um, and first, I want to thank them for taking the time to join us today for this very important conversation. Uh, let me give a, a quick bio on each, starting with my good friend Afra, who is a professional fellow of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and the managing director of Raymond and Pierre Limited where he heads the firm's real estate and special projects department. He also contributes to the press and broadcast media in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. Special areas of interest include real estate, property development, land use planning, property taxation, property financing, and the 2009 bailout of the CL Financial Group. Afra is past president of the Institute of Surveyors of Trinidad and Tobago, 2009 to 2010, and past president of the Joint Consultative Council for the Construction and Industry, the JCCI, having served between December 2010 and November 2015. John Dowse is a senior managing director with Ancura with the Ancura Consulting Group. He's qualified in both construction and law and has some 40 years of industry and consulting experience in procurement and the delivery of several complex billion dollar construction projects in the UK, Europe, the Middle East, the Caribbean, and North America. John also specializes in, it specializes in the turnaround of distressed projects and the resolution of complex disputes. John spent more than 11 years living and working in the Caribbean, advising on projects from his base in Trinidad and Tobago. He now also works out of Toronto, Canada. He continues to be active in knowledge transfer and education programs regionally and internationally as an advisor or tribunal member in arbitration and alternative dispute resolution fora. He regularly appears as a guest speaker on discussion panels, including recently for organizations such as the American Bar Association, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the Canadian Institute of Quantity Surveyors. And Michael is a King's Council, is a member of the Bar Library in Belfast and the Law Library in Dublin, and practices actively in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and England and Wales. He has a busy practice in public procurement, competition, and commercial law, particularly in disputes concerning major public and public-private projects. Michael has appeared as counsel in major procurement cases and provides legal and strategic advice for bidders and purchasers throughout the procurement process. He's also active in many dispute resolution cases. He has oft oft often been appointed as arbitrator, mediator, and expert by CEDR, LCI, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the Technology and Construction Solicitor Association. Most of his appointments involve disputes concerning investments or long-term contracts involving the public sector or utilities. 
He's a visiting professor at King's College London, where he teaches e-public procurement in the LLM degree and the director of the Distance Learning Diploma and Masters in Public Procurement Law. Michael became a leader of the European Circuit in autumn 2022. He also blogs about procurement law matters at https mostly procurement.typepad.com. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for agreeing to be part of this review of the UP, UP report today. The question is, what have we learned? And I will ask John to kick us off. John? Thank you very much to all for the uh, introductions, greetings and welcome to everybody, old friends and new. Uh, yes, as Nigel has just indicated, my first job today is uh, really to, to look at what was the purpose of the UF report. Um, Simone has already indicated it followed a commission of inquiry back in 2009, 2010. Uh, for those online now or indeed listening to the recording later, copies of the report are still available on the Trinidad and Tobago Parliament website. But perhaps the easiest way of finding it, because I, I did find the Parliament website to be a little difficult to, uh, to navigate to find the paper. For those who are interested, if you type into a search engine, UF Report 2010 Trinidad, it comes up quite readily. Because we're looking back at the report and trying to find out what has happened since and where we are, it's first of all beneficial to look back at what the mandate of the report was, what the conclusions of the report was, and a number of the uh, recommendations which Professor Uff made together with his co-commissioners in concluding that report. The mandate for the report was framed by presidential orders, which commissioned the report. And Professor Uff described the purpose of the report in, uh, in a number of points, including inquiry into practices and methods, making recommendations and ob observations, inquiry into procurement methods, fairness of competition in the region and in Trinidad and Tobago particularly, the standards of local capacity and capability within the construction industry, standards of workmanship, the degree of integrity and transparency in procurement and in management of the projects, together with performance issues on behalf of both government agencies and contractors alike, accountability for their actions, and ultimately whether construction within Trinidad and Tobago on public projects actually gave value for money for, their, uh, for the public purse. What Professor Uff concluded, and his report was something of the order of 500 pages long, or the Commission's report was of the order of 500 pages long. Um, I have summarized it into a few bullet points. The Commission looked in some extensive detail it's a number of projects which are at the time of public interest they were regularly in the media for failings such as late delivery overrun uh, even some suggested corruption those projects included uh, it matters run by the hdc by udicott by nipdec by the education facilities company limited and others Although the report clearly says that no corruption was found, I think, they, I think it has to be qualified that that really depends on how you define corruption, because the report did go on to raise issues of very questionable performance by both contractors and government entities. It highlighted poor financial controls, a lack of consistency across the government entities who were procuring projects, in both the procurement processes and their subsequent management methods. It questioned the integrity and transparency uh, of operations, both on the part of the government agencies and contractors who, who were performing and executing the contracts. It raised the very important issue that construction 
in Trinidad, particularly in expenditure on public sector projects, had a very poor level of perception with the public. There was a great deal of unhappiness. And that possibly arose out of the fact that there was a perceived lack of accountability for non-performance. There was a culture of non-enforcement of contractual rights and obligations when projects were being performed. That it wasn't always the case that the right people were in the right area doing the right jobs. And indeed, there was an apparent lack of training for those who were charged with both procuring and managing the projects. Out of the extensive number of recommendations which the Commission made, and they were wide, wide ranging, and I think there were about 70 recommendations in total, there, they, can be head, uh, they can be headlined by a handful of items. And I would summarize it as follows. There is a need to cultivate openness within the industry to address the public perception. Accountability of the industry must improve, must be improved through a proper definition of the tasks and functions of the various players. There should be a standardization of rules for procurement across the government entities that each one should not act individually. Uh, and this would also give better governance on behalf of cabinet as well. And there should be a series of recommendations industry-wide for good practice. Training should be increased throughout the industry for both contractors and government staff to reinforce existing capabilities and develop new skills as well to keep Trinidad and Tobago's industry up to date with current practices. But there was also a need for cultural change, for increase in transparency, evidence of integrity in public procurement and the elimination of what were seen as personal relationships and predispositions in the award of certain government contracts. Since then, it's questionable what impact the Uff report had and just how much of it was actioned either by government or by the construction industry itself. On the face of it, there doesn't appear to have been much done at all. If one reads the papers on a daily basis, there's a continuation of problems of late delivery of projects and escalation of costs. In the past couple of years, there have been notable court cases involving the likes of the MBD, for example, in uh, identifying corruption and corrupt practices. There is still concern over what actually happened on a number of the mega pro projects, such as Government Campus Plaza and the Brian Lara Stadium which ran into hundreds of millions of dollars excess costs and years of delay. And there appears to be no significant changes led by the industry itself. So questions which I'd like to address with the panel today, and very interested to hear the audience participation, is what is preventing the change? And how can we achieve change? Is there an awareness of the need for the change? Is there the desire to make the change? And do, does the industry and the government actually know how to implement the change and then reinforce it once it's in place? With that introduction, I'd like to pass back to Nigel so he can introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'll now ask Michael to take over the batting um, and then we'll finish with Afro before we get into the conversation. Michael? Good morning, everyone. Is it still morning? I think just about, maybe just off. Um, I, I, I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, Trinidad. It's a great pleasure to be here and a great honour to be in, invited uh, to speak at this event. Um, and I'm not going to speak specifically about the AF report, although uh, I, I've spent many happy years working with, with John Aff and, uh, um, and I remember him uh, talking in great, in great interest about the issues that were being raised by, the, uh, by, the, by, by his work on the Commission. Um, 
uh, uh, whatever, uh, over a decade ago. Um, <clears throat> um, my background is in procurement law, both domestically within the UK and around the EU, but also within in, in, in more, more broadly in, in, in a number of other countries and dealing with international organizations and so on and so forth. Um, and um, I've nearer to, to Trinidad, I've been following rather more closely the development of the procurement legislation in Barbados, um, so that, which is an interesting comparator, uh, which we may get time to pick up in conversation as to how that process, how and why that process has evolved um, a few years behind the, the, the Trinidad legislative process. The, 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 I wanted to pick up three points today. Um, firstly, to talk a little bit about the policies which are typically invoked uh, in support of the sort of procurement law, what it is that people want procurement law to do, uh, and a little bit about the history of where that comes from, and then talk a little bit about what they, the problems are that flow from this multi-policy uh, package which, um, which arises. Talk a little bit about some of the structural problems with procurement law, about what one can really expect and then, so sort of the, the, and then really loop back to, to look at how the, the 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 tensions between the political expectations of the public sector um, can often undermine procurement law um, in ways which might be superficially innocent or seem sensible at the time, but can create long-term problems. I think the overarching point here is that procurement law is really difficult and no one has really managed to crack the the, the nut of, a, of putting in place a law which uh, provides all that you would want in terms of fighting corruption but providing also the flexibility to enable the right things to be built or delivered or the right services to be supplied at the right time and to meet the uh, the, the, the the emerging um, agendas around sustainable development and so on and so forth. Um, and that's not to say we shouldn't keep trying, but um, sometimes some of the rhetoric one hears is a little bit over optimistic. The, the, the Trinidad uh, Procurement Act, I'll use that as a shorthand if I may, uh, um, because it's got a, a, a nice long name. Um, public procurement and disposal of public prop, public property, and I shall, I'll come back to that. It's rather, I, I'm very much supportive of the, of the fact that the, the two points are linked. But in section five, um, you've uh, as good as illustration as I've seen almost anywhere in the world of the problem of packing every policy you could possibly think of into one section. I think you've got accountability, integrity, transparency, value for money, efficiency, fairness, equity, public confidence, local industry development, sustainable procurement, sustainable development in procurement, oh, and yes, um, integrity, et cetera, and disposable of public property. Um, try and think of another law which tries to serve all, as many goals all at the same time. I mean, we know what the law of murder is about. It's about not killing people. We know about the law of contract is it about. It's on the whole about either make, I mean, at best it's got two goals. It is asking people to, to perform their contracts or pay damages if they don't. Um, not many laws have, uh, I did count them up. Is it 14 or 15 different policies to pursue all at the same time? Um, and I fear that, there, sometimes it's just not possible. Indeed, some aspects of, uh, of procurement law do undermine other aspects. And I'll try and make that good as we go along. At the heart of all of this is, is, a, is a historical issue. Different procurement laws um, often have different historical backgrounds. And internationally, the sort of the, the, the top level uh, measures are the United Nations Convention Against Cor Corruption, and the WTO government procurement agreement, which Trinidad is not a signatory to, but it is hugely influential because it, it influences the way, for example, in which uh, multilateral development banks look at procurement. Um, 
these two measures deal with quite different things. The one deals with corruption, the other deals with uh, issues around market efficiency, integration of market, openness of trade, and also corruption, uh, but all at the same time. And one of the things they all do, because they say it's, it, it, it's at the heart of everything, is, trans is, is put transparency at the heart of the process. Well, that's right, and certainly the Trinidad law puts that puts puts transparency at the heart of the process but it's important to remember that transparency itself means a lot of things in most procurement laws including the trinidad law transparency means at least um telling people about the opportunity to compete for um for a contract so telling people what's going to happen secondly once you've announce your competition, telling people what it is they're going to compete for and what the rules of the process will be, how you'll evaluate, basically setting out for bidders the rules of the game. Um, <clears throat> then thirdly, applying the process as you said you would apply it. So it's no good setting out the rules of cricket in a particular way if you don't have umpires who understand the rules of cricket and actually do, do, do that, that's part of transparency. Um, if, they, if, the, if the umpires come and play, apply, apply the rules of baseball when you've turned up um, to the Brian Lara Stadium, everyone's a bit surprised. That's not true. That is inconsistent with transparency, but it's different. Then disclosing the outcome, absolutely crucial, disclosing the outcome in a way that can be challenged. Now, that, of course, depends a bit on what your challenge process is. Um, but you've got to be able to, at the very least, to tell the losing bidders why they lost so that if necessary, they can, in the Trinidad um, the, the context, they can go to the Office of Procurement, in other places they can go to the tribunal or to the courts, whatever it is. And then finally, and something which has really come up with a, with a real vengeance in, in a number of countries over the pandemic, is public interest transparency. This is all fine, but everything I've talked about up until now is a little world in which uh, the, the players are all the bidders and the authority and maybe an outside co contract auditor. What about, um, what about the, um, the public interest? What about whether it's Transparency International or, 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 the, or, the, or, the, or the Caribbean Governance Institute or, um, or, 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 or someone wants to say, wait a minute, why have you done it this way? Why have you awarded a contract to someone where, on terms which are completely inconsistent with the government's sustainability goals? Um, is that something which procurement law should serve? There's, there's quite a vigorous debate going on in English law, for example, at the moment, is whether or how far procurement law should be allowed to give people the opportunity to ventilate these points. Now, um, I have to be a bit careful what I say here because I've been defending various public institutions uh, in a particular way. Um, uh, but it does seem to me that perhaps if procurement law is really to serve its long term goals, it needs to be uh, open to rather. Um, rather broader range of challenges. Uh, let me just put that rather in rather Delphic way. What mis oh, there are various things which are difficult to, to come through procurement law on the whole does not match up very well with performance and contract management. Um, I think the Trinidad law does a rather better job than European law on the whole. There's a, European law has a structural problem, which I we don't need to go into now. Um, the, but there is a basic problem that you can spend a lot of effort looking at to how to procure something well, and you think you've got the right person, but it does not necessarily follow through into performance management. Um, and trying to tie all of that in is, is often problematic. That, of course, becomes particularly difficult when you start looking at the way in which you measure value for money. And that the, the, the measurement of the, the, the definition of value for money in the Trinidad legislation is itself interesting. And I could probably talk for at least an hour and a half about different ways of, value, of measuring value for money. But if I can just throw up one, 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 one tricky point, which I think comes go, going forward, and that is around sustainability again. Um, at the moment, the value is very much as defined in the various regulations and in the Act, 
it looks very much at whole life costs, maintenance costs and so forth. What it doesn't do is go to the next stage, which is what we're starting to try and explore in European law, which is to look at the externalities, by which I mean this. If you are buying buses and you want to look at the cost of buying buses and you want the buses to have clean exhaust or whatever, um, do you just measure the cost? How do you measure that cost? And one of the things that people are looking to do is, for example, to value the cost of the bus by reference to the increase in infant mortality from having dirty exhaust. Um, how do you try and tie that into the cost? Because you know, to the state, a dirt, dirty exhaust is, 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 is an expense to society far beyond the value of the bus. Um, this becomes a real complication going forward because, and, and, and I can illustrate this very starkly in the sort of cultural dis difference one sees across Europe. In Europe, we have, we have a number of different pressures in public procurement, and it, it's, it's, it's almost become almost a sort of national stereotype. If you talk to Norwegian or Swedish or Danish procurement lawyers, they're, they're absolutely obsessed with the environment, with sustainability, and so on and so forth. They will tell you that, that number one, the number one thing should be sustainability, and is this contract going to deliver the, the best result for the long-term sustain for, 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 for creating a circular economy, meeting environmental goals, and so on and so forth. If you talk to some to a procurement lawyer from Romania, Bulgaria, or Greece, they will say the only thing that really matters is to squeeze corruption out of the out of public procurement. And every time you put in one of these complicated criteria about the environment, all you're doing is giving a local criminal the opportunity to set up a corrupt, fake certification operation for the certification of whatever it happens to be. Um, and all of this soft, all of these softer factors could bring bring the potential for corruption into the uh, bid evaluation process. Um, and the problem is they're both right. Um, it's very hard to meet both of these issues at the same time. And I can you know, list dozens of cases where, where, where these two points come into, to, to come into play. Reconciling all these points is a very, very difficult task. Um, and that is where I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I think it is very interesting and very important that the heart of the system should be an effective regulator that is able to really look at the nuances of each procurement and the requirements of each procurement. And in reviewing the, what, what has happened, have powers to investigate in some detail what has happened and whether or not the particular requirements of that procurement have been met. Um, and to sort of re reinforce that encouragement, one of the problems we have in English procurement law, which is uh, a part of our heritage as an EU country, where we get our procurement law from, is that our challenge process is based on a court system where the challenges are brought by the dissatisfied tender, tenderer. And the difficulty with that is on the whole, there, there are a limited number of things that dissatisfied tenderers are going to challenge on. Because by and large, if you tell tenderers, this is what they need to bid for, they'll they'll play the game. If you tell them to play baseball, they'll play baseball. And if you tell them to play cricket, they'll play cricket. They don't really care if that's the wrong game, if they should have been doing something altogether, if they should have been doing something more environmentally friendly or whatever. If, if the rules are that they have to be corrupt, they'll be corrupt. If the rules are, they, they will play that game. All they really mind is they lost. Um, and unfortunately, our court-based system therefore has, not entirely, it's done for, be, be, I shouldn't be too broad, but, but has tended to be very much driven towards uh, looking at who wins, who loses. And uh, that drives a high degree of transparency because bidders really want to get to the bottom of what has happened. And a lot gets revealed what you do see what has happened, but the court itself doesn't necessarily focus that much on, on misdeeds along the way. Um, it, it looks at the, at the ultimate result. And I'm not sure that our process really digs out, gets the roots out um, corruption. Now, 
an effective regulator, and there's a lot, I've put a, a lot of value in the word effective, um, is, is, is really crucial um, and, 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 and valuable going forward. So uh, that's probably enough to say. My, um, in summary, um, there is a danger, the constant, and we've very much had this in the UK, that people get the idea that procurement law is there for one reason or another reason or whatever. And when it doesn't deliver in the fully to the degree that people expected, there is then a considerable amount of disillusionment. And the reality is procurement law is only one tool towards changing human nature. We are dealing about, particularly when it comes to corruption, we are, about, we are dealing about the worst, most venal institute, in, instincts of human nature. And one little law is not going to fix that. Um, and it, one needs to guard against the sort of cynicism and disappointment that, 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 that flows when, 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 when one discovers that procurement law can only do so much to achieve that. Um, that's not to say I've enjoyed doing procurement law for the last 35 years, so I shouldn't be too down on it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Michael. Afro, this is this has been your passion for a while, so let's hear from you. Okay. Colleagues, are hearing me fine? Very clear. Good. Hi. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me, and it was lovely listening to John and uh, Michael speak on the off report. Uh, Michael, you were more on the procurement law, but that's also of tremendous interest and central to this concern of ours. Let me start off by saying that the importance of the off inquiry was that it was an inquiry to the public sector construction industry. Okay, that was in the terms of engagement, public sector construction industry. And uh, it was an inquiry called by a government in power. Normally commissions of inquiry are called in the in the seesaw of politics. So this party is in power and they would invoke a commission of inquiry against something that that party did. Very seldom does one have a commission of inquiry called by a sitting government into an ongoing operation, which was described by the prime minister as flagship. Unicot, which is at the center of the inquiry, the urban development company in Trinidad and Tobago, was considered by Mr. Manning and he said it repeatedly, Unicot was this, flagship of the state sector. And Mr. Kola Hart, who was the executive chairman of Unicot, a, a white Canadian emigre, Mr. Kola Hart was in fact, Mr. Manning's most valued public servant. So we have to place it in context to see its importance. And the timing is very important because at that point the country had literally endless money, which is really at the root of the problem. <clears throat> I was involved in it because I was one of the people calling for the inquiry. Transparency was calling for the inquiry. The Joint Consultative Council for the Construction Industry was calling for the inquiry. The current Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, he, he, he became a political what is it, a dissident within his own cabinet and was eventually fired for it. He was calling for the inquiry. So there was a cross-section of us, Winston Riley, A.B. Elias, a cross-section of us were calling for an inquiry to what was happening at Unicot and in the wider construction sector. And I want to make some points. I, I actually testified at the inquiry, okay? I was one of the witnesses who gave testimony and I have a full of evidence and my name is in the inquiry and so on. But I want to talk a little bit about what are the big lessons we learned coming out of this? What are the big things we learned? The first thing that we got to remember which some of you listening may not be aware of, but I, I'm, I'm here to, to, to have this conversation with you. The first thing you've got to be aware of is that there was every attempt to suppress the report because the tradition in Trinidad and Tobago is a commission of inquiry into something that is potentially damaging or embarrassing. It's conducted as a way to take pressure off. Bread and circuses, give them something on TV. And the report is suppressed and, and released years later when in fact, it may have lost its currency in the public mind, yes? When the report was finished by Professor Off, around the end of March of 2010, 
we got word, and I would say certain things here, I've not said it on TV, I would, I would explain certain things to colleagues here. We got word that it was being doctored. That is the country we live in. It was being doctored by the political directorate before it would be published. We got word. And we had to bluff and go to see the then Attorney General, Mr. John Jeremy, Senior Counsel, Oxford, Cambridge, all kind of, doesn't matter. You had to go to see Jeremy and say to Jeremy, listen, we have a copy of the report. You had to bluff him. We have a copy of the report. And we understand you all are trying to fix it up and adjust it. And if you continue with that, we will publish our copy and embarrass all of you. So stop your foolishness, publish your report. Which is how come the off report got published. And of course, as we know, seven weeks later, Mr. Manning's government fell 24th of May, 2010. That was, that was the explosive character of the examination by Professor Alf and Desmond Thornhill. Two other commissioners left along the way, Israel Khan and Keith Sergio, they left along the way, but that's not part of this conversation. That's true. Okay. So the first thing to be very clear on is that there was every attempt at the highest level to suppress that report. But to get it published, we had to be conscious and take a set of actions to force it into the public. Second point I want to make, because you see the tradition of secrecy. Michael, you made an important contributions about secrecy. The tradition about secrecy and the importance of secrecy to maintain a culture of wrongdoing, okay? Is that in fact, after the report was published, in, in about April of 2010. And of course, Mr. Manning called an election soon afterwards. Just for those of you wondering, I called the name earlier on Caller Hart, the white Canadian emigre. Mr. Manning called him to an office meeting at his office, the prime minister's office on a Sunday night. The next morning, he left Trinidad and Tobago on his first flight and never came back. I know some colleagues earlier said there was no evidence of corruption and so on, but he never came back. Whatever reason, he left all, left all his things and he went, not here. Okay. That's what we had to walk. We had to swim through that to get to this point. And I would deal with John, I would deal with your point about the, 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 the response from the construction industry, because I, I don't agree. I mean, respectfully, I don't agree. In fact, we did have a tremendous response to the of reports in that we produced a complete procurement law with regulations on the 23rd of December, 2010, and gave that to the People's Partnership government. That was at the center of this whole exercise, which is why Michael spent so much time on it, rightfully, <laughs> okay? So the construction industry certainly played a leading role in that, and I will talk a little bit about that. It wasn't that, 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 that nothing happened with the construction industry, a tremendous amount happened, and we need to finish that piece of work and get the procurement law proclaimed. But let me go back to off. The other thing about off, is that the, the other party, not the PNM, took power in 24th of May, 2010. And uh, we were happy working with them. We sent them a, a copy of the, of the draft report, we, the draft law we had written. And we started lobbying them to get the law passed. And there was a joint select committee and so on and so on. And to our surprise, although we shouldn't really have been surprised, to our surprise, The proceedings of the Commission of Inquiry were made to vanish. The proceedings of the Commission of Inquiry were on a special website, and I believe Off was the first commissioner to have a website that actually made the entire Commission of Inquiry go live. So it wasn't just on TV, it was online. All the submissions were available online. You could see all the affidavits, all the rules of the inquiry. And that was an extremely valuable resource for our work. That was made to disappear. The website subscription wasn't paid, it wasn't renewed. Somebody pulled the plug on it and the proceedings of the Commission of Inquiry were made to vanish. Some of us are very suspicious and cynical. I am one of those people, that's why I said us. And I had been on site on that website with my, my colleagues. I have some IT colleagues who work with me and we had ripped the whole thing, so we had the whole thing saved. So despite the effort by the succeeding political administration 
to suppress the revelations because the report was already out. But the actual testimony, who said what, when, how did he answer that question? How did she answer that question? That was suppressed. I've got copies. So the off report is a signal moment in the country's history, indeed, in terms of our development going forward. The other issue I wanted to say about off, the third issue, so the first one was about the suppression of the report. The second one was about the disappearance of the proceedings. And the third point is about the focus of off. You see, the first, the first phrase in the, the first phrase in the Commission of Inquiries, Terms of Engagement, which is at page 380 of the report, is that in fact, the item number one, the president was asking often his colleagues to look at procurement practices in the public construction sector. And it's my respectful view that in terms of what item number one was front and center, the report examined a lot of important things, a lot of interesting things, a lot of truths were uncovered, but in fact, the decisive thing in my opinion was not really examined. And the decisive thing is the lack of a needs assessment. And this was a serious difference between myself and my colleagues at JCC. Because the very first stage of the procurement process, the word procurement is used in that first line of, of, of directions. The very first stage in the procurement process is to have a needs assessment, a feasibility test. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Colleagues in JCC didn't agree with me. The concerns that were expressed by those people, including Dr. Rowley, were about improper tendering, the possibility of bribes, improper assessment of tenders, the, the, over, the over award of contracts to foreign contractors, particularly Chinese. That was, that was the agenda that was being discussed. And I had a different agenda. My agenda is that even if all those things were satisfactory, what is the point if the billions that we are building and the projects that we are concerned about are unnecessary and the country ends up saddled with white elephants, which is what we've ended up with. Every single building in Port of Spain, half of our capital city was rebuilt. Every single building in Port of Spain would fail a feasibility test, irregardless of whether they were properly tendered or just done by a local firm or local engineers. All of that stuff is subordinate. The reason that point number one in the procurement cycle is needs assessment is the point I'm, 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 I'm engaging with here, okay? So it is reflective. So you had Professor Off, who's a, who's a, who's a, who's a QC, he's a lawyer, KC now, and a professor of engineering, PhD in engineering. You had Israel Khan, who's a criminal lawyer. You had Keith Serju, who's a, who's a civil and structural engineer. You had Desmond Tornell, who's a former permanent secretary. And the actual decisive question within the needs assessment of, of financial feasibility was never examined. It wasn't examined, it was not mentioned in the report. And I consider that to be a serious gap and I'd like us to talk more about it as we go forward. There's also interesting, some of the interesting things I'll run through three or four before I wrap up. Some of the interesting things in the report were that in fact there was a tremendous amount of detail given about corruption. I would mention one, one, um, <laughs> one example for you all, which is the, the Briar Lara Cricket Academy, okay? And uh, Professor Huff talked about it at length in his report. Pages 147 to 154 of the report, he details the tremendous number of wrong payment certificates issued from Unicot to pay Hafiz Karamat. The chief financial officer of Unicot at the time was Sophia Noel, FCCA. Okay, and her, and her evidence is in here. Ms. Noel's evidence is in here, which is cross-examined by Professor Off and is, is being examined on the question of backfitting and so on and so on. So this is this is a matter of record. This thing was published in April of 2010. So it's not, it's not correct in my respectful view to claim that there was no evidence of corruption because in a private company, somebody being found unable to explain those sorts of payments of millions 
would have lost their job and probably their professional letters. It did not happen in this case. That's all part of the political melee and, and, and the cloud of confusion, carefully crafted. The absence of a written contract, I think at page, page 220, we mentioned that HDC, the Housing Development Corporation, had 64 large projects and 591 small projects. That is the total of all the projects HDC had at, at that time. Large projects are over 50 million TT, and none of those projects had a written contract. So that, that, that's an important finding. It didn't make its way into the 91 recommendations, but it's an important finding. Another one, holding to account. John, you mentioned it, and I'm not going to repeat your point. You made the point very well, John Dows, about the whole holding to account question. That in fact, contract terms are not routinely enforced. And there's only one contractor who enforces them. We know that is my erstwhile colleague, Emily Elias. He, he, he enforces them, OK? Um, there's also local versus foreign contractors. Recommendation number 43 actually speaks about the fact that local versus foreign contractors are that the, the local contractors should receive some financial benefits to compete with foreign contractors. And that in fact, there's little difference in the quality of, of, of the workmanship between the people. And uh, in fact, at page 296, paragraph 34.2, this is very interesting for those, for those doubters out there. Here's Professor Off, the first sentence of the paragraph. First, in relation to the capability of the local industry, we have seen nothing to indicate that local contractors and consultants are not capable of producing high quality work and of undertaking complex projects, subject, however, to certain limitations based on capacity and experience, where the use of foreign contractors and consultants is justified. In other words, the quality of the output from the contractors and the consultants was equivalent to the quality of the output from the foreign firms. And then of course, there's, a, there's three final question points to finish off. There's a cabinet control of state enterprises. That's a big question. How much control and how does cabinet control a state enterprise? Should cabinet control a state enterprise? In other words, a company incorporated under the Companies Act, which sole shareholders is the state. How is that control exercise? And the procurement law actually deals with that. We can get into that in the Q&A. Then there's the question of consultation, item number 17 of the, 70, of the 91 recommendations, where in fact, it makes consultation a very strong recommendation before any development is undertaken. And my final point is a tender evaluations, which is item number 39 of the, of the 93 items. And that is at page 308. Actually it says that in fact, tender evaluations need to be done in, in as transparent a manner as possible. Those are the main substantive findings of the of inquiry in my view. They, I didn't, they don't all correspond with recommendations, but that is my reading of the report. I've read it over and over and over and over, over the years. And we have not implemented most of it and we are paying the price. As, as you said, very, very um, uh, carefully, you said that John, we pay any price for it. So I will close up at this point and open the floor, my Nigel, back to you chair. I'm, I'm back to, back to Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you very much, Afro. Um, I want to I want to focus on your 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 needs assessment, and I want to do that by referencing the latest ISO standard on governance. Yeah, and 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 what that clearly says is that, and I I, I am quoting in Good. the introduction. The pursuit of purpose is at the center of all organizations and is therefore of primary importance for the governance of organizations. True, true. Good governance of organization lays the foundation for the fulfillment of the purpose of that organization in an ethical, effective, and responsible manner in line with stakeholder expectations. It goes on to say, good governance means that decision making within the organization is based on the organization's ethos, culture, norms, practices, behaviors, structures, and processes. Good governance creates and maintains an organization with a clear purpose 
that delivers long-term value consistent with the expectations of its relevant stakeholders. <clears throat> For me, the point is, and I think Michael alluded to it, the procurement legislation is one weapon in an arsenal. And without, as you said, I mean, you, you refer to it as needs assessment, the what and the why. For me, that's the purpose. So if, if that purpose is not clearly defined and articulated, then how you, how, how you achieve that purpose in the absence of purpose, you know, anything, anything goes. And I would appreciate if you gentlemen, uh, you can, we can start with you, Afra, um, kind of deal with that and, and the importance of procurement legislation or any form of legislation designed to, to either prevent or, or detect corrupt activity in the context of that purpose. <clears throat> Nigel, hi. I will give my answer. Thank you. I will give my answer in, in the form of a worked example. Because apart from giving testimony, Professor Alfati gave me the opportunity for a precious 10 minutes to question the kingpin called the heart. There was a lot of lawyers who were very concerned because a non-lawyer was going to exercise their privileges. I wasn't concerned. I knew what I was going to ask. I'm a very focused person. And I remember saying to Hart, of the very many projects you built, the office, the commercial projects you built in Port of Spain, did you conduct feasibility tests? Yes or no? Very focused. He said, yes, yes. Um, in fact, um, only in one project. And I said, really? Which project was that one? Because I don't know which, which one of the ones you did. But there were many of them. He said, the International Waterfront Center. We're high at this. I said, okay. I said, let me ask you another question. What was your break-even rent? What was the figure you got per square foot for your break-even rent? He said to me, about $20 a square foot, which at that time was ridiculous because the highest rent in Port of Spain at that time was $12 a square foot. So at 20, as they say in Trinidad, you're bust on your average. Okay. I then said to him, 20? He said to me, yes. I said, so what figure did you, did you use for the, for the land? Did you include land in that? He said, no, we didn't include land. That is the, that is the, sheer, that is the sheer intellectual dishonesty that has beset us because of failing to address this question. So it's like somebody going to a bank manager, Nigel, you were managing director of a bank with a business plan to open a food company to sell chicken and chips. And they have all of the costs, the boxes and the napkins and the janitorial services and the drinks and the security and the air conditioning and the lights and the furniture and the equipment in the kitchen. And the one thing they don't have any feasibility test is chicken. Because it's a chicken it's business. The first thing you have to buy is chicken. A, const a construction project, the building has to stand somewhere. You can't be doing a project and, and arguably the most valuable land in the country and you allocated a value of zero. That is high level fraud. And at that point, I said to off no more questions and I left because I, I, had, I had him. But they weren't concerned with that, the off, the off people. All the other people who in the room who were arguing, they weren't concerned with any of what I was concerned with. I mean, and I'm bringing it here. Let's debate it. So thanks, Nigel. Thank Sorry, I was on mute. John or Michael? Michael, would you like to take the lead? Yeah, no. there we go. I'll take the lead. I mean, it, this is a very interesting topic, and it really is one which which the law deals with very that, that barely deals with at all, um, save in one perhaps one, one significant respect. Um, this whole question of, of, as it were, 
commissioning the wrong thing. You know, people talk about corruption, but it is just as bad of an abuse of public money in my in my mind to to build a project which you don't need or is uh, willfully over expensive. Um, you may argue about who's benefiting from it. Well, it'll be obvious that some people are benefiting fr from it. Um, they meant to be the people who did the original planning. Um, I mean, it, it may be that the state or some parts of the state have an institutional um, bias or need to have big projects because it justifies the existence of this department or that department or whatever. Um, I mean, there's any, any amount of explanations you can give. Um, but what is it really interesting is, is of course, we are, uh, history is littered with these um, badly planned projects where the costs in terms of construction cost, in terms of environmental cost, are willfully under that, under costed. And, um, and, and the, the benefits are willfully over. Uh, 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 overvalued um, and it's very hard to attack that because uh, other than through some serious independent audit function um, society doesn't really have a very good way of dealing with this and, and there'll always be someone to say oh well you know if we had you're just being a bean counter if we all if, if being if, if there were always bean counters around checking every um checking every new project we'd know that you know the romans would have never built the Colosseum, and the egyptians would have never built the pyramids and you know there's always you know you need you need some things for these these grand things need someone to be take a grand a grand gesture i mean i think uh, i need to be a little bit careful what i say it's very much an ongoing project i mean it seems to me that um the high-speed rail line currently being built in the uk has all the makings of this exact problem with um, with knobs on. Um, uh, I, 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 I've been litig I think I can say this because I've been litigating only against HS2 rather than for them. But, and, but I mean, and I can I can I can't claim any special knowledge. It's only what I read in journals like New Civil Engineer and so on and so forth. But and and politically. But but it, clearly that was a project which to some extent exists only for political reasons. A labor a dying Labour government decided to announce it at a time when it looked like a good way of getting credit with constituencies in the north of the country, sort of almost dared the, the incoming conservatives to uh, cancel it. They didn't dare cancel it because it would have made them look like as if they were anti-Northern. Um, but ever since then, it's been sort of, well, why do we really need this? I mean, so I, so I can get, so, so when eventually in 20 years time it exists, I'll be able to get from London to Manchester 20 minutes faster, and I'll have spent the country will have spent how many billions in the way in the, in the cost and damaged what done how many billions of pounds of environmental damage? What on earth is it? You know why? Why was this really the right the right thing to start? Now all that money will have been spent, but at the very least that money could have been spent on hospitals we need or other things which we need much more urgently than a, a, a railway line, which has become largely just a sort of political thing. Now, um, my great hero in all of this, I don't know if you've met, many, the rest of you, I'm sure have come across him, uh, an individual called Blent Fleivberg, who is a professor at the University of Oxford, who's written some great books. One called R Mega Projects and Risk is probably the most readable of them. And he's just about to bring a book out, I think, I think next week, I think next Friday, um, called How to Get Big Things Done. And I, I have no financial incentive here. I don't know him personally. I have no, no, no I, am, I am not getting any revenue by plugging his book, but I do order his book on Amazon. How to get big things done is Flyveberg, L-F-F-L-Y-V-B-E-R-G. He's a Danish professor at Oxford. And I mean, he, it is fascinating, his analysis of this sort of institutional bias towards, um, ending up building the wrong things to benefit the wrong people. Now, I think so, he, I think he says, takes it slightly too far um, and because he, he, for example, would be very, very critical of the Sydney Opera House, um, <clears throat> which he would say was, you know, badly planned, went wildly over budget, blah, 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 blah. 
Now, it may be because I like opera or because I like grand architecture. I think it was a worthwhile thing to build the Sydney Opera House. But you certainly don't need to fill your city with 50 Sydney Opera Houses. You, a bit, at most, you need one. Uh, and you certainly don't need your entire civil engineering sector um, churning out white elephants. Uh, there is a balance to be struck between maybe one or two white elephants every, every couple of decades and then for the rest of the time building what the people really need. Anyway, I'm not sure that was any of that was relevant to the question, but uh, I, will, I will shut up and let, let, let John move on. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, thank you, Michael, and thank you for stealing my thunder. I was going to refer to Ben Heiberg as well. I'm, oh, glad sorry. Sorry. I'm glad you assassinated his name before I did. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has the opportunity of researching him, his papers are wonderful. He has written many, many papers. Okay, may, I, may I suggest you type his name in the in the comments? I, I I'll do that wanna... while John talks. While John talks, yeah. go I'll ahead, John. Thank you, Michael. Okay, you carry on. Thank you, thank you, Nigel. Um, he has written many, many papers, all on the subject of in, infra, uh, prominent infrastructure project failures, mega project failures. It's important to recognise that no island. No island is an island in this respect, that every country struggles with the procurement and execution of mega projects. And everyone, as Michael has just noted with regard to HS2, and perhaps you just have to look at the uh, cross London rail link to see multi-billion dollars, multi-billion pounds over budget still not complete. The feasibility and the validation of a purpose before you execute is very important. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And when we look at it, you have to question it. Here in Toronto recently, uh, Doug Ford, who is the Premier of Ontario, announced a spent expenditure of $10 billion on a highway that someone said would actually save each commuter 30 seconds on their journey. You have to laugh at that. I can see, I can see Harper chuckling at that. You have to laugh at it. And I think this is where, I cannot remember Bent Feiberg's exact phraseology, but he refers to misrepresentation and deception. And it's become colloquially, uh, colloquially corrupted to uh, those who are involved are, fool, are either fools or liars. They deceive themselves or they deceive the public. And this is, this is the important thing to consider when looking at public procurement. What degree of political biases that are involved in it? Why is this being procured? An example might be uh, the, the millions of dollars that were spent in Trinidad just on the consideration of the light rail a few years ago. Mm. Uh, and the projects which were sidelined Things like social projects, which were of importance in East, po in East Port of Spain. Redrainage, expenditure on drainage of a city which floods every time it rains in favor inve of investigation of a light rail system, which it's questionable how many people would have used it. It was also rumored about how many people were buying up land along the proposed route of it. And one then has to look at it from the perception of corruption and say, just what is going on here? So when we're looking at it, it's ultra important to establish the viability of the project. And I think in this respect, another of Bent Flyberg's uh, discussions on cross-functional communication is very important, that you need to involve parties from different areas, from different disciplines, who will not only look at the procurement of a project from a technical point of view, but will bring different dimensions to the discussion as well. Nigel, back to you. Thank you very much. So the question then is, we need to start with a conversation. I've referred to it as the needs assessment, but a conversation with the stakeholders 
as to why we are doing what we are doing and, and what we hope to achieve by doing it. And, and I think one of the things that, that comes to mind is, uh, do we need a big project, a construction project to achieve the desired purpose or are there other ways? And having that conversation um, publicly, I suppose, uh, it, it's interesting because one of the things I, I, I do is I consult on, 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 on strategy and strategy, of course, begins with purpose um, and, and the organization's purpose, whatever that purpose may be. But in the context of, a, of an entire country or a government of a city or whatever, one needs also to have that conversation and, and, and place whatever specific projects there are in that overall context. Just, just, just thinking out loud, Afra. Right, Nigel. I just wanted to read, I'll paste it into the comments so everybody can see it. I wanted to read number 17 out of, 17 out of 90, 91 recommendations. And it says, mm -hmm. user groups and other interest groups should be properly consulted on decisions regarding public building projects to ensure that relevant views are expressed at the appropriate time and taken into account before decisions are made. Yep. Which is the point you were speaking to. So I wanted to make the point that it, it, it found expression. Yeah, the and, and, I, and, I, and I actually made a note next to it. I said consultation. The, the, yeah. the, but 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 I wanna I wanna even go back before that and and suggest that in let let's let's use for want of a better word in 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 a in a in a budget document or in a in a um, political manifesto because we entered into the political realm that overarching. Um, purpose, that mission or, or, or current mission should be clearly articulated. And then specific projects placed within that context. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts? I mean, there's, a, there's an issue also as to what are the interests you are protecting against um, you know I, at an extreme version um, I don't know if anyone to the, uh, one of my favorite places to visit is Sicily and one of the reasons why it's so nice to visit Sicily is it has the most multi-lane empty multi-lane highways going to all of the most mm. beautiful destinations and you That's hardly better. ever see a car now yeah. I don't. Let's not. We don't have to get too much into the history and sociology of Sicily to consider why that might be. Um, <clears throat> now I'm not saying that everywhere is like that, but to be blunt, um, <laughs> the construction industry can't always be trusted to come up with the best ideas as to what the next project should really be. Love them to bits, but mm -hmm. the, the the construction industry's first idea. Uh, may not always be the best idea and the minister of transport or at least some of the staff in the ministry of transport may also have reasons for doing things which aren't always the best idea but but at least roads do something or sewers do something um you know there are other things which are you know you you, you do just wonder what why why anyone came up with the idea in the first place um and then of course you have the, the you know the, then there, there is also the, the potential for real tragedy of course um, if, if things are not properly managed. And um, although we, again, I should be careful what I say here because we haven't got the final report, but uh, we're beginning to get a lot, of, a lot of conclusions coming out from government about the Grenfell Tower disaster in London. And that is plainly, at least in part, the product of just appalling mismanagement of procurement and, and building regulation, particularly around um, thinking about how to get more housing 
to meet sustainable building goals and then someone uh, and to meet heating insulation goals and someone thinks well the way the bright way of doing that to keep the heating costs down is to put this on the outside of the building but no one actually thinks through what the consequences of what they've just done and you suddenly discover you have a country with high rise filled with high rise uh, high rise accommodation with inflammable materials all, 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 all over the outside and you wonder how on earth did that happen mm -hmm. um it's just bad planning now someone's done quite well out of that mm -hmm. Really yeah, I, I think uh, I think it's fair to say that the construction industry within any country probably has certain mafia tendencies. Uh, and I didn't say I, that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mafia-like tendencies, uh, and I think it, it's is recognized in every country that it is an opportunity to uh, to certain, uh, wash certain dirty laundry and to make things clean, which might otherwise not appear to be clean. The, what I see though in, in my time in Trinidad was that, and I see it in other countries as well. Uh, in fact, I've said for many years that the construction industry is very good at reinventing the wheel. Unfortunately, that wheel very often result, very often turns to failure at the end. And I, I think there are lessons which every country can learn, every jurisdiction can learn uh, from other countries, both their successes and their failures. Um, the... Michael made a comment a, a few moments ago, if I noted it correctly, that the construction industry cannot always be trusted to come up with the best ideas. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. There is, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, public money being seen to be spent on questionable projects. And again, we get back to what is driving those in the first instance. Is it political expediency? Is it the Labour government going out of power and launching something which will curry favour with, um, with its voters? Is it uh, well-known figures from soccer backgrounds currying favour with their uh, local electorate uh, and pursuing, activity, uh, pursuing activities which uh, are questionable in themselves. Um, did the country need a Brian Lara stadium? Did it need a, a, a high speed rail link? Thankfully, the, from my perspective, thankfully the last one did not go ahead. Uh, to my mind, there are, there are more important things to, to look at. But what I would say is having spent time in the islands and particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, it must not be forgotten that there are always more, there's always more than one player active here. And if there are concerns about corruption, then it can be addressed by the contractor's side of the industry, as well as by the owner's side of the industry. The procurement law on its own will not mm -hmm. remove uh, the potential for corruption it needs far more training. And th this was an aspect which was brought up by John R. Uh, and the other commissioners, that training was needed, that it was not just a matter of going to university, coming back to the islands and standing still afterwards, that there is a constant evolution to be done in the industry. And I, I think that for having spent, I was in Trinidad when the uh, Contractors Association celebrated its 40th year. And I remember the then president, Emil Elias, giving the keynote address. And essentially he was saying after 40 years, nothing has changed. And perhaps the question should be, why is nothing changing? And what can we do to bring about that change? It's clear at the moment that procurement legislation is struggling to get through parliament and to get a proclamation. So what else can the industry do 
to protect itself and protect the public going forwards. Nigel. Thank you very much. Well, um, why don't I ask Afra for that? Or anybody else for that matter, we can open up the conversation. But Afra, what, what, how would you respond to that? Well, I, I'm trying to obey our agenda and stay to the off report, okay? And okay. I, would, I, would, I would bounce with you, John, because you made a point that was very tantalizing. I can't help responding to your point with respect to the Brian Ara Cricket Academy. I dare say the two projects I've spent the most time discussing was the Brian Lara Cricket Academy and the, and the Cleaver Heights project at Cleaver Woods that Elias was involved in. And what is striking, because for those people listening to this, colleagues who are listening to this in this, in this seminar today, and I'm going to use this to demonstrate what it is I'm saying within the covers of the off report about the lack of attention to the question of needs assessment or feasibility. I've spent a tremendous amount of time analyzing in Brian Lara Cricket Academy. There are payment certificates that are dissected. A consultant, Jerry McCaffrey, flew in from Scotland. They analyze everything to death. Really good work. I'm not going back over that ground. And they made a lot of startling findings about the extent of the wrongdoing. And he even said painfully at one point, they didn't know how much money was missing. How much money had been paid. Misallocated, let's use the phrase misallocated, happy phrase, misallocated. They didn't know how much money had been misallocated, but it was certainly in millions. But the most interesting thing about the Brian Lara Cricket Academy is this, which of course the report is entirely silent on. If you leave San Fernando, and this is for the local people, if you leave San Fernando and you get onto this Solomon Ochoa Highway and you're heading north, and you get to the breast of the first hill after you leave San Fernando, the Brian Lara Cricket, and you start descending gently. The Brian Lara Cricket Academy is just on your right. If you pull your car over into the emergency lane and you stop your car, and you look just off to your left, not far away, just off to your left, there's another stadium there. The Manny Ram John Stadium is right there. And one has to ask the question in a country of 1.4 million people, what what in heaven's name are we doing with 10 stadia? If the Queen's Park would oval, we have the national area of for sure. We have Dwight York. We have the we have the um we have so many money Ram John. Do I um the one in Arima? Larry Gomes. 400 and 300 years from now, when people come, going back to Michael's remark about the number of highways in Sicily, three or 400 years from now, when people come back to Trinidad and Tobago, archaeologists, and we are all gone and they're sifting through the remains, nobody will be able to make sense of it. This place must have had 20, 30 million people to have this many stadia. It must have been a nation of, of, of your Olympic champions. Because even in a city like London with 13 million people living, you don't get two stadium next to each other like that. It's perfectly ridiculous. So the most ridiculous feature of the Brian Lara Cricket Academy, the report is just not concerned with that. He's concerned with things and the, the American company stand and a whole lot of a whole lot of analysis of, of the engineering issues coming out of the project and the financial issues. But the feasibility and necessity issue, silence. And, and that is something that will come back to bite us the number of white elephants. Nigel, you said it earlier on. You have one every two decades, but Otherwise, it's going to sink us. Um, so, so, so for me, I think one of the things that that I find in 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 the in the public sector generally is this, I suppose, um, disposition to build new as opposed to properly maintain what exists. Um, and it happens again and again. And, and I suspect that the, the, that lack of focus on, on purpose kind of contributes and exacerbates that situation. Uh, how, would, how would you respond to that? So we go, we go building new 
when we could be either retrofitting or properly maintaining what exists and how do we ensure that we have the right governance around what exists so that it's 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 usefulness and and it's it's longevity are are, are extended or, or maintained. Okay, well, I'll stick my neck out, shall I? I think that is yep. historically, Nigel, a political problem. Um, and uh, I can, you know, again, speaking from my own domestic experience, and some of you all were familiar with some of these problems, and other apologies to those who aren't, um, you know, we, we're quite capable of, in the UK, of wasting many millions on pointless capital projects when we should have spent the same money on, on maintaining the bridge next door. And to give one obvious illustration, um, someone who was mayor of London for a while, who then went off and got, got some other jobs, wanted to um, wanted to, to mark his importance by building a bridge across the river. Um, spent oh, nearly, I think it was nearly sixty million pounds on a bridge which never got built, and was concluded that it would it would it would never have been a maintainable, sensible bridge. It wasn't a bridge that went anywhere that anyone really needed to go. It was going to be a mugger's paradise. Um, mm -hmm. And funnily enough, the amount of money that was wasted on that bridge is exactly amount, the amount of money that wasn't would have been needed to maintain the bridge at the end of my road, which hasn't been open for the last five years because London hasn't got the money. Um, now, why is that? That was just because the political vanity of an individual gets the better of the boring, something boring like just doing up something that was 100 years old, or 100 and, older than 100 years old. Um, so there's a sort of political vanity, but this is where I think, this is where I think procurement law has a chance, possibly. And you know, the law, if it includes within its goals, let's go back to those goals, um, down at the end, sustainable procurement and sustainable development. Um, those are developed in some of the regulations, in some of the evaluation criteria, and uh, these are the this is from section five of the Act. Um, it will obviously be very much for the Office of Procurement Regulation to develop those ideas in its procurement policies as to how those are going to be measured and so on and so forth. But one of the things that it might be open to either the regulator or to a civil society organization to, 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 if there's sufficient transparency to know what's about to be built, is to challenge these things that are about to be built at, at, during the planning stage or during the procurement stage and say, well, why are you doing mm -hmm. it this way? Couldn't you achieve what you wanted to achieve in a way it means that better corresponds with the legal obligation to achieve sustainable development by doing this, that, or the other? And if something fails a, a sustainable development ma 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 measure, then it, then then perhaps it just should just fail. But anyway, I'll shut up. Thank you, John or Yafra. Just two, two quick responses, Sir Michael. Here, Michael. Firstly, the procurement law actually contains a provision to cover this this window we, we, we've been discussing and, and negotiating with the whole benefit of transparency, yes? And part of the benefit of transparency, linking back to Nigel's point about consultation, which is, which is at the center of my concerns, part of that is that procuring agencies are required to publish an annual procurement plan in which they will set out what they intend to do in the, in, in the, in the coming year. And that requirement to publish an annual procurement plan together with identified funding, actually tackles two big issues. Issue number one is the one Nigel and, and Michael spoke about, this transparency issue, engaging the public, what are we doing, the sustainability issue, yes? And issue number two yeah. is one of the hidden things about the construction industry that we don't discuss much, it is not, it is not clearly recognized by non-practitioners, is that in fact, the government, the politicians are happy to turn this on for this project, that project, and the other project, but only have funding for a limited number of projects. So they turn this on projects 
all the time. And then we have funding in place for six out of 10 projects, which means that projects inevitably, regardless of the integrity or the skill of the contractor, get delayed. They cost more because it takes longer to build the same building. You have to keep security in place for longer. You have to keep insurance in place for longer. Yes? You have to rent toilets for longer. <laughs> it must cost yes. more. So, more. So, so, so that, that simple provision for the annual procurement plan tackles both of those concerns, and that's why you put that in there. From my personal perspective, I, I agree with you, Afra. I have seen a number of projects where the... Uh, the contract was let at a figure to suit the budget which had been allocated for that year. There was no scope beyond a nominal allowance within the tender for any change occurring. Uh, and this has resulted in extensive litigation, not just within Trinidad, but within the other of the islands as well. But my experience was tended to be focused on Trinidad that uh, when it came to changes on the projects, prices escalated, uh, tempers flared, people lost patience with one another. And the underlying question was never really answered. And the question, is, the question, why has that happened, is really lack of adequate financing. And this lack of adequate financing, we, we do see it exhibited in uh, a lack of desire to maintain assets rather than create new. That might be put down to public vanity, Another dimension of it, which I've heard discussed in the past, is uh, the differentiation between an asset being publicly owned and an asset being privately owned, and, where, and whether, private, uh, whether private ownership is actually better for the country than public ownership. Uh, perhaps cricket stadia fall within that uh, ambit as well. But having recognised all these, do you think that there is adequate public awareness of a need to change? Mm. Afro's gone off screen. <laughs> yeah, he's on mute. Um, I will exactly drink I don't. some water. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes Afro, think, how would you respond? I'm getting a bit thirsty. <laughs> I would say to you, there's a tremendous public interest and understanding of these issues. Just answer John's question directly and clear. As somebody who's been writing about this for years, television, radio, I live in the capital city, I work in the capital city, I travel throughout the country, and people I don't know walk up to me all the time. Ordinary man in the street, humble, modest people walk up to me all the time and actually are able to discuss in detail something I might have been campaigning about six months ago or a year ago the increase of the land, the value of the land, the cost of the contract, what was the consequence of this or that. So people do have a, have a public concern about the issue. I certainly would say the answer is yes. The, the, the challenge before us is trying to get this law, which is now passed through the parliament, it's been amended, the parliament has agreed the regulations, trying to get that law proclaimed. But as, as, as I said to the chair, out of respect for CCGI and the estimable Mr. Nigel Romano, I am staying within the bounds of the off report. <laughs> so good question, Thank John. You. Good question. Thank you very much, Afra. Um, before I before I open it up to the to the others for questions, and I see Mr. Doc, Dr. Samuel is very uh, uh, active yes. in the in the chat, so I'd like to hear from him. This design bill versus design tender. What, what 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 are your thoughts on that, and 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 what are the implications? Because it's it's actually mentioned in in the report around 43, 44, 45, 46 um, in their recommendations. What 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 are your thoughts on on that? Educate us. Anyone? Um, okay. I'll I'll kick off. Both procurement methods are workable. They can have the successes, they can have the failures. Traditionally, design, bid, build, the original employer design, contract to build procurement method, uh, required a big investment from the owner 
to develop and design the project beforehand. Under design build, a lot of the risk has been shifted to the contractor and not necessarily, mm. who's not necessarily afforded the same uh, time scale to develop the designs. So you end up going to contract with 10% design, 20% design, uh, that level of design certainty, which increases the risk. If you're aware of those risks, you can manage them. But it, it, it isn't just one party that needs to be aware, it's all the stakeholders that need to be aware. If, for example, you have a, a highway which passes through a number of municipalities, and each municipality is subsequently taking ownership of assets such as bridges within, within their boundaries, then consideration needs to be given to that during procurement. And I, I think this is where some of the failings, not just in Trinidad occur, but other, other jurisdictions as well. I've, I've had one here in Toronto. It resulted in a claim of $150 million because the requirements of one municipality were not adequately communicated. It increased the risk. Michael, any thoughts? Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of work being done by colleagues, I know, at the Centre of Construction, Law and Management in at King's College on all of this, and um, David, and, and one of the areas which actually fits in with um, other, other work is that um, the problem with a lot of the, the sort of, the, the, the on the one hand, the, the mixed um, the turnkey or design and build projects have a tendency perhaps to dumb down some of the design, which can create some of, some of its own risks. Um, but there is some evidence coming through that in fact, a more modular approach to a lot of this sort of procurement would be better anyway. And that that would be a a more effective, more cost-efficient way of dealing with things. But the problem with the more modular is you, you know, you then say, well, why, why is our, why, why, you know, why is the country full of porter cabins? You know, every, every 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 public building looks like a series of porter cabins just dumped on top of each other. <laughs> um, you know, you want to avoid that. I I find this quite a diff. I'm not. Sh I, I I struggle with some of the empirical material. I'm not sure all of it is really evidence, and so I, I struggle to have a clear answer to some of this. Afra, any thoughts? My my answer on design build is that design build is, is is put about as a method that is simpler because it's a single point of responsibility. That is a that is a phrase mm. catchphrase used by its proponents. And in terms of risk management, it's seen as a better, a better win for the client because you have one, one point of responsibility. The difficulty is that you can have a fairly important building that in fact you as a client had a very limited role in its design. And the examples I would put here forward for colleagues, because we're having a discussion with colleagues, We be buildings like Napa and Sapa, but those were done under design build. So we had buildings that were effectively national monuments. Napa for you, Michael and John, you know, but Michael Napa means the National Academy for the Performing Arts. Okay, so you have a building that was a tremendous national importance. It's a satisfactory solution, pocketed very neatly in one place, in one, in one corner. But in terms of the actual overriding objective of the project, which is a needs assessment and the sense of the purpose that Nigel opened with, it is entirely unsatisfactory that the design should not be taking place in our own halls. Because mm. for example, by contrast, NALIS, which is our, Michael, our National Library and Information System on the southern side of, of, of Woodford Square, our central square in our capital, NALIS, was not done under design of it. Now, this was a traditional form where you had a brief, 
that was designed by a competent, well-experienced local architect. And it was eventually tendered and constructed. And, it, and, and the difference is chalk and cheese in terms of citizen participation, the way it's integrated with the, with the surrounding buildings and so on. So this is, these are not, these are not um, for me, these questions go way beyond, beyond dollars and cents. So that the discussion is really about off. They go way beyond dollars and cents. And in fact, they return to the actual sense of the project, which is where I started off with mm -hmm. the needs assessment. It returns to the sense of the project. So that little example of NAPA SAPA analysis might give you all an illustration of what of what's at stake when you're talking about this. Yeah. So for example, I doubt a bank. Let's go back to the, to the commercial sector to make the point. I doubt a bank. Royal Bank or Republic Bank or any one of those prominent banks would, would, would build its headquarters under design and build. No, they wouldn't because it's the headquarters. They keep a design competition. They invite designs, they have essays, they would have, they would have citizen participation. One, the, the, the World Trade Center is not being rebuilt by, by design and build. They have extensive citizen participation because of the importance of the building whatever we think of America and so on. It's important to them that they get it right, that they have extensive participation and discussion, agree designs, they have design competitions globally, and then they will let the contracts. So design and build as far as I'm concerned, it may be, it may be satisfactory in, in a sort of, a, in a, sort of a, a yardstick to use my spoof over the MBA approach to the thing where you just pocket all the risks in one corner and it, it, it really does satisfy that equation. But it, it does it in no way satisfies other important parts of the equation if we talk about major construction projects and major civil projects, which is really what off was really his main topic was off. Coming back to off, yeah. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, can we open it up? Any questions um for the panel or comments? Raise your hand, uh, yeah, you should you should call on Dr. Don Samuel directly because, as you see, he's been placing so many comments in the chat during the the entire uh -huh. so far. So I know he has several areas, several points he wanted to make. Um, so Don, maybe you want to start with the the last point in the chat. Oh, thank you for that consideration. I was going to defer to my other colleagues in the chat. I think I've. I've been ruling chat a little bit. I've been saying too much. <laughs> so I will, <laughs> defer, I will defer at this point to anyone else. And then I could always come back and have a question. Anyone? So I would say if, if you know, there are no hands up at the moment, um, uh, Don, if you would want to to make your contribution now. Or... Well, thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you for this opportunity. And, and of course, many thanks to the very esteemed and qualified panel. It was great listening. Um, I think I was a bit quiet until um, Mr. Raymond started firing up his engines. <laughs> and then I started to fire up my engine. So... Because he's passionate, and the reason why we are all passionate about this particular issue is because I believe that this issue of procurement of the off report is the most important issue that we have to face in this country for our future development. I, I tell people all the time um, that the what kind of future are we living for children if we cannot address these uh, procurement issues at this point? And in fact, um, last week when I was on a radio program, um, the, the um, host asked me, so what is the biggest challenge with the procurement um, challenge that we have? Uh, why can't we get it right after he mastered the off report? And I said to him, which is which actually my first comment in, in, the, in the chat, is that we have to boil it down to a sense of ethics. Um, at the end of the day, um, yes, we can, we must hold the government responsible for some of the construction procurement, well, I'm talking about the context of construction procurement, some of those issues we are facing. But it, it also goes on to the persons implementing in the various ministries and state agencies. And corruption in construction can only happen if there's a team effort, just like if there's a team effort to stop corruption, there's also a team effort to enable it. So I think I, I would have wanted to make my comment there and um, 
to also see um, that, and there's one of the things I put in the chat, which is that we need to start planning construction projects outside of the political cycle. We have a five-year political cycle, and that has in, been an enabler for corruption or potential corruption. And I think we need to go beyond that. And that re requires civil society organizations to continue to stand up and say, here's what, enough is enough. We need to figure out first, is this project feasible? What is the reason for the project? How is it going to benefit the national good? And then we take it from that context and go forward. So that's just my um, two cents or five cents, as they say. Comments? Nigel, if I may, yeah, uh, I I would uh, I would like to to comment on that last point that Don made in terms of you know getting civil society involvement and um to really ask the question because it was something that Afra also spoke about um and and also mentioned by the other two panelists in different ways. How do we get that level of involvement? Now I know. Everyone knows Afra is extremely active um, in Trinidad and Tobago with bringing awareness and so. And so he says that there is a great level of awareness in society, but can we truly say that we see that by comments being made by civil society, you know, and, and what can we do? So we have um, among our participants here quite a, a, a bit of, um, students, quite a few students, you know, what can we do that will help build this movement where there's an engagement on the part of civil society to speak out on very large projects that's going to impact the country? How can Are we- Are you throwing that? that question off to anybody in the panel? Well, actually, I, I would have loved to have a comment from um, any of the students who are uh, present here in terms of, is this an area of concern that they feel as well as you listen to what are some of the issues and challenges that we have here in Trinidad and Tobago? Do you also feel that there's a need for us to have further engagement with civil society? And if we do, how can we help make that happen? Well, close up. Huh? I, I think in any society, uh, there has to be the awareness for the need for change. And there has to be a want for change as well. Afra made note that he has people coming up to him in the street and supporting him. And that's extremely good. It shows an awareness of the need for change and some desire for change. The next stage is, do people know how to change, how to effect the change? And perhaps that's something that can be brought to awareness through further media coverage, through, uh, through the CCGI giving uh, articles in the paper. Afra, I know Afra is, uh, and always has been for the time I've known him, prolific in his writings and uh, his appearances within the media. But it, it's promoting that desire uh, i think jokingly before the uh, before the discussion started today we were talking that everybody is now diverted towards their interests in carnival and yes it, it's it's been said that trinidad has two seasons it has christmas and it has carnival uh, it's a little harsh at times but the the sentiment is that unless you bring unless you involve people and give people the desire to be involved, then it's going to fall flat. It's going to be a very, very slow process. That's my two cents. So Thank there's you. a comment in the chat from Kevin Balde who's saying, um, Nigel, and I actually mm -hmm. I was going to go to that because uh, very early on, Kevin made a, a, a very provocative comment. Um, he said he's, he was speaking about the um, waterfront project, I think he said, the justification offered by the Prime Minister Manning at the time, right, for the government campus, right, so it was government campus, which is opposite the, the waterfront project, was that public servants are more productive in nice buildings. And now he has added to 
Um, another very interesting point, he says the problem with the five-year cycle idea is that it assumes the other political party will not be equally invested in a corrupt project. And I find that ties in very nicely with the point Afra made earlier when he's, he gave his three points in his, his opening remarks. And one of them was the fact that the information from the Commission of Inquiry was made to disappear during the time that there was another government in office. So um, if Kevin, if, if you're willing to participate in the, in the conversation as well by an, unmuting and sharing your thoughts on both those comments, you know, um, have you found that, that building the government campus led to any better productivity on the part of the civil servants who occupy it there? And, um, also, do you see um, signs that, that the various political parties in, in Trinidad and Tobago want to see things, things done differently? Hi, Kamala, and hi to the uh, rest of the group. Uh, very good, interesting points raised by each of the panelists. Um, basically, the answer is no. I mean, I raised that point about what Mr. Manning said to show how there's absolutely no feasibility it was ridiculous when it was stated, and obviously it has led to no greater productivity. Um, in terms of the political parties, no. Um, politicians have perverse incentives. So as long as we have governments and the state involved in projects, you're gonna have the lack of feasibility studies, you're gonna have corruption. So my perspective is how do you get the state and governments out of these projects? How do you create the private sector initiatives, incentives, uh, which will lead first to feasibility because nobody's going to undertake a project unless there's profit in it. And mm -hmm. secondly, corruption does become an issue because you want value for money. So if the panelists could address that issue of um limiting government um involvement in, in in projects i'd be interested to hear the ideas i think it's very yeah, difficult in an island society uh where the bulk of the capital expenditure on construction is funded by government I think it's also difficult when you you uh, rightfully highlighted one of the uh, one of the reasons stated by Mr. Manning at the time for the development of Government Campus Plaza. Uh, perhaps less flippantly was another statement that there were so many millions of dollars a year being spent on the rental of private sector office space. Uh, that it warranted the development of a government-owned campus. I don't think anybody on the panel will have seen the, and correct me after you may have done, you may have seen some validation of that statement in, in the way that the government is now spending on rental, et cetera. Um, but it, it is going to be very difficult in, in an island society to, to limit the government's involvement in it, particularly when you are looking pre uh, predominantly at infrastructure projects. Roads is the big one. And I did have the opportunity of listening to Don Samuel on a broadcast he did last week on IETV. Um, there is a network of roads to be maintained. There is a network of water distribution main, uh, mains, mm -hmm. not only to be maintained, but to, to be constructed to get to parts of the country which still do not have adequate water supplies. Having, put, having private investment in that is very difficult in an island society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Afra, any thoughts? Yeah. Two responses. Sorry, Nigel, I keep, um, I keep reserving. No, 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 no problem. No, no, not at all. I try to go to Thanks, but seriously, two points, um, Kevin, good points. Let me just say, let me share it in two ways. The first thing I want to address in the Mr. Manning myth about the first class offices and so on. One of the big negative things we should never have swallowed 
was the notion that our civil servants, our public servants, use what phrase you want, all have to be in first class offices. That is something that we have we have now accepted 20 years after the, the propaganda started. We have now accepted it somewhere in our breasts. And it is absolute nonsense. I worked as a professional in London, chartered surveyor. In the office of you chartered accountants, engineers, lawyers, architects in different government departments. And we were in B-class offices. What is the B-class office? They have no elevator. They have very limited parking. So one building I worked in had 40,000 square feet of offices and eight car parking spaces. You have to take a bus or take a train. Okay? This notion of the government renting car parking all around, so nobody, it's, it's, it's absurd. It's absurd, absolutely absurd, and totally indefensible. Go further. Let's get into the numbers, because you see Nigel is the chairman, we're going to the chairman. He's an accountant, he's a finance man. Let's go to the chairman, and let's expand the discussion out to the confines of engineering and lawyers. Let's talk finance to finance. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and for me, average I mean, break I, I, even rent. Hold on. So, go ahead. Sorry, Nigel, you go ahead. Chairman, you go ahead. No, no, no. You may finish making your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The average break even rent when Mr. Manning's administration was building all those buildings in Port of Spain was about $20, $21 a square foot. The break even rent, just to do a quick back of the envelope thing. You add up the cost of the land, the cost of the construction, the cost of the design, and the cost of finance. The design being the professional services, engineering, design, architectural design, and so Those four elements are the, are, the, are the backbone of the calculation. You then amortize that over the financing period to get a figure per year that you have to pay back a banker because you borrowed all this money. Yes? Mm -hmm. And then you divide that by the number of square feet and you get a rent per square foot. That figure is a break even rent. If you make less money than that, you have to put your hand in your pocket every month to pay back the banker because the banker needs to get paid. If you make more money than that, there's a chance with skillful management of your taxation affairs, Nigel, that one could actually bring a profit home to your shareholders. That's, that's the correct approach to the thing. The actual rent, I kept trying to find out, and they never answered me. Mr. Mr. Manning, Mr. Paul Hart, my friend Conrad Enel, who was in the cabinet at the time, they never answered me. What was the actual rent that they were paying per square foot? Because you were being told it was being done to save money, yes? My estimation as a practitioner working in the capital, my estimation is that the rent we were paying per square foot on average in Greater Port of Spain was between $8.50 and $9 a square foot. So to save money, we're building $21 space to stop paying the wicked landlord $9 a square foot. And if you put that, if you're financially literate, you put those things together on a spreadsheet, literally makes no sense, it will never make sense, it will never add up. It is just a foolish waste of money. It is a, I'm saying it directly, it's a foolish waste of money. And, and, and the thinking still goes on. So when in December 2020, when the new Ministry of Health headquarters in Queen's Park, Savannah was announced, public-private partnership in the Emily Elias' firm, NHIC, Ministry of Health, Elias was designing, financing, and building, same DFB method. The ministry would rent the building for 15 years and then buy it per dollar, I suppose, at the end of it all, and so on and so on. And there was a huge pronouncement and publicity and so on. Why did we need to build 243,000 square feet of offices at a time when people were working from home? Of course, the project has started before COVID, but why did we need to do that? What was the needs assessment? I don't understand it. And this is not any allegation of impropriety or anybody took a bribe or anything. No. This is just the, as far as I'm concerned, this is the hard core of the question. If we have to understand of, and to understand of, you have to understand the gaps of, of the lacuna of, of. okay? This is the hard question. Why are we doing what we're doing? And the ministry, it's a building going on now. And when that building was announced, the Minister of Health was very proud to tell everybody on the day that it turned this on, that they were going to be saving $10 million a year. I, I did calculations that demonstrated that in fact we're paying $25 million a year more. This is, this is the folly 
that we're dancing with. So we need to get a little more financially, economically literate, and this is all part of the work. So this this is a lovely seminar. Thanks very much. And 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 I think it goes back to again doing making being very transparent and very clear about why you're doing what you're doing. So so the argument is that somebody makes the argument that we are spending too much money on rent as opposed to owning and 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 maintaining and and then clearly laying out the 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 various reasons whether it's financial or um social or um whatever but making 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 the argument very clearly and laying out the pros and cons the the benefits and the costs and and more importantly after doing that then tracking measuring so that you you in fact um uh, Quite, um, realize the benefits that we intended, and if not, making the necessary adjustments. Again, this is, I mean, I, I have to be very, and not even the private sector does this as, as effectively as they should, but it's something that should be done. Um, and, and, and I'm with you, I'm not, I'm not, um, people, people like to rush to the corrupt argument. In a number of situations, people just don't ask the right question before they embark on whatever projects they are embarking on and end up making um, poor decisions. Um, and it happens in the private sector as well. Um, the, the consequences in the private sector, uh, usually bankruptcy or, or, or other, other types of, of failure. But the point is, it is important to to have those kinds of analyses and that kind of transparency purpose, as you said, needs analysis. Why are we doing this? What are the benefits to be had? And then having those conversations so that one can, can make one's case, but also listen to different perspectives and get, and get different, um, different solutions that, that may achieve the the intended purpose. Um, Donna Wallace is, has been making some comments. Donna, you want to expand on your comments? Uh, Donna, particularly in, in respect of your comment on the absence of the feasibility studies and res risk assessment and so. Um, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I'm not seeing her unmute, Nigel, but um, one of her comments yeah. was that the absence of feasibility studies, risk assessments, and the like seem to be deliberate inactions geared at ensuring that the cost of construction or completion is at large. Oh, I see. She just put in the chat that her mic is not. Her mic is not working. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, 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 mean, I, 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 I hesitate to go to say anything is deliberate or not. Um, mm -hmm. I prefer to give people the benefit of the doubt. The point is that one should be, um, be very clear about purpose, and 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 be open to 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 discussion and debate so that one arrives at the most appropriate uh, solution a lot of a lot of times people just don't know because they have never done it like that before and and for me it is important that they they open up the conversation to 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 debate at at at, at every level possible because I think once, I mean, and, and the off report refers to it, arrogance and, and, and secrecy are the, 
are not the kinds of um, behaviors that 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 engender um, good outcomes. And and if we may discuss that in itself a little bit, um, Nigel, because I know Afra has really been um, an excellent example of of stick to itiveness or, or, or doggedness, even in, in some cases, in terms of trying to get information. So when we talk about transparency and wanting to have transparency in our practices, um, one of the greatest challenges that we face, and maybe this is one of the things that impacts why we don't have more civil society um, involvement, it is the, the difficulty in being able to get information so that you can accurately assess and, and make statements and pronouncements on things that are happening in the public space. So, so Afra, if you want to share with us, you know, what is that process and what does it take from you, you know, to, to go through the, the, um, the process of writing under the Freedom of Information Act to be able to get information and so on. Maybe those are things we need to address as well if we are going to have more informed uh, public decisions. Yeah. Yes, uh, Kamala, thanks. And to the chair again, um, I would say that Professor of returning to the of Moorings, the Professor of actually certainly recognize the importance of transparency, not just the Institute, Trinidad Tobago Transparency Institute, but the conceptual value of transparency as a practice. He recognized mm -hmm. Victor Hart and he recognized Neil Stansfield, came out of transparency, the national as a lawyer, in experience in commercial contracts and corruption and so on. So it's important that we have transparency so we know what is happening and when it's happening. And that's the reason why in writing the law, we put in the annual procurement plan. That's the reason for putting it there. So if, you, if, you, if you're an electricity company, you have to publish what do you intend to do for the next 12 months. New power station here, estimated 30 million. So people have an idea, a sketch of your roadmap. There are no, there are no more phantom projects. The Freedom of Information Act 1999, which is our law governing access to information. And that's what they call it in Jamaica, in case any Jamaican colleagues are tuned in. It's corresponding act in Jamaica is the Access to Information Act. ATI. The Freedom of Information Act 1999 here is actually, I would have to say, a very advanced law. It contains beautiful provisions. It was, it was very artfully written, very powerfully intended piece of law. Beautiful provisions, very advanced, to secure the rights of the citizen, the information that is in the custody of a, of, 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 of a public authority. It doesn't have to be authored by the authority. It doesn't have to be belong to them. It doesn't have to be a contract they agreed. Once it's in their custody, the citizen has the right to it. And there are certain exemptions, and the exemptions are also beautifully crafted with a, with, a, with a balancing provision in terms of a public interest test. So if an exemption is invoked, 24 exemptions, if an exemption is invoked, you have to actually carry out a public interest test as the public authority to decide whether or not this person gets this information. And of course, one can go to court. The, uh, the one, point, one point I'd like to make, Kamala, that I have discovered as, as an ardent researcher on these, on these linked topics, one thing I've discovered is that there's a tremendous amount of material out there, which to be frank, nobody ever reads. This is very little four letter word is appearing now. That word is nerd, for those of you who are getting nervous. You fall out where this nerd. <laughs> this very nerd comes <laughs> out because there are certain documents, there are certain documents that I have read, important documents about things, housing, transportation, planning, whatever. And I can tell you when I go to the originals, I'm the first person looking at it. Nobody's looked at it for X amount of years, 40 years, 35 years, and so on. So there's a certain way that the public to come back to chime with Kamala's important point. There's a certain way that the public has to want to know. Nonetheless, there's an obligation on the public authorities to create this information and publish it so it's available when somebody wants to look. But it's really important. Really, really important. 
You want me to say more than I can now, or is that, is that okay for now? I'm, I, I could pause there. Did John and, or, or Michael have anything to add? I mean, for me, that that whole um, for me that whole procurement, as you said, the published procurement plan is is a is a is a good step. But for me, it, it has to be placed in the context. Of, of an entire strategic plan. And, and, and from where I, I start, the, the, the organization's purpose and its values are critical, are the foundation for any such procurement plan. And that procurement plan has to be placed in the context of whatever the organization's current mission is. In, in service to its, its, its wider purpose. Because uh, I'm a big Jim Collins fan and, and purpose doesn't change. The, 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 the current mission in service to that purpose may change, but, 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 but the, the purpose is, is, um, is sacrosanct, if you will. And the, the values that inform how one achieves that purpose is also very important. Um, so in that context, the, any procurement plan should rest within, within, within that framework. One thing I have noted, and it's not untypical of uh, smaller societies is that that the procurement process is almost is almost invariably vertical here you have the government you have the state entity you have the contractor uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere where there has been success in uh, major public infrastructure and indeed Brent, uh, going back to Bent Flyburg and paralleling it with the uh, the National Highways Authority and uh, Highways Agency in the UK now, they're going to much more horizontal structures within procurement societies uh, to share responsibilities between stakeholders and involving the contractor as a stakeholder as well, not just as a, not just as a supplier. Michael, is that something you can comment on in relation to the UK market? And, and if you will, can you give an example or example? Go ahead. I think Michael is trying to unmute. Frustration. <laughs> oh, silly. Go, That's good go, to sign language. Go. <laughs> I think Michael might have to log off yeah, and log yeah, back on again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you give us an example of what you what you're referring to, um, John? Well, at one time, a highway would and highway maintenance would normally be procured through. Uh, through a mandate from the government to a regional authority who would let contracts. Nowadays, uh, it's a much more horizontal, whereby the planning is done by the contractor. The planning of a maintenance scheme is done by the contractor. They enter into longer term uh, agreements so that there is a, a wider benefit. I think Michael's back with us now. So I yeah. will. Uh... Where were we? Um... Yeah, and the, the whole, uh, I'm not sure how effective it, I mean, one of the things which the public sector is trying to do is obviously to, to, to make, to, to create developments where the contractors are more responsible for the management of the asset which they build. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of formulae for doing that. Um, and in terms of procurement, um, I would very much defer, as I mentioned, to, to, to colleagues who've been doing quite a lot of empirical analysis on this at King's College London, where, of course, one of the things, it, it isn't just now about maintenance, it's also about sustainability. And so where 
the um, <clears throat> and about supply. And it, it's not just purely horizontal, it's all about supply chain management to achieve sustainable goals. And the, the tool which everyone is talking about now within the context of, of these goals is, 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 is building information management and applying BIM tools in terms of design, using those to, to evaluate not only the costs of construction, but also the maintenance costs, the environmental impact of development, and to undertake, and this is another area where there's considerable tension between the goals of, of, of transparent procurement and achieving achievement of these goals, because a lot of this involves negotiation after award of the contract down the supply chain. And so you end up effectively almost renegotiating the price after you've you've had the tender process. So there's a there's a uh, but this is said to be the way to achieve high value, um, high efficiency, productive projects. Mm. Uh, I'm you'll get that I'm I'm wording I'm I have a measure of skepticism about some of it myself, but <laughs> anyway. And, and 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 for me the question would be how do you how do you measure whether the objectives are being achieved and then what opportunities are there to to adjust the 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 the, the arrangement if the intended outcomes are not achieved? Well, uh, that depends on the project. So, uh, yeah. for example. One thing which has worked, which I have, which I do think has worked quite well in some projects, this is not, this is, it, it, you know, at the at the maintenance end, is I've been involved in running sy operating systems where um, the the procurement is done on a, on a fra on a regional framework, as you've uh, much this more or less the same definition of a framework as you have in the Trinidad procurement legislation. It's in the regulations isn't it it's in the procurement procedure regulations i think 2021 um and what you then do is you incentivize the achievement of good performance and good environmental costing by uh, changing people's uh scorings every on a periodic basis so that their ability to get the next contract under the framework is entirely dependent mm -hmm upon how effective they have been in achieving the goals that were set for them um, in the previous year. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, pretty basic stuff. Now that works for something like highway maintenance. Right. Um, as I said, there's a lengthy report just been produced by King's, King's uh, at the end of last year, focusing on how this can be done for bigger projects, particularly with a view to achieving environmental standards and, and trying to address the sorts of points that you're raising, Nigel, about how you set up use, usable empirical goal uh, standards. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go to the, say, if you, if you search David Mosey uh, or search Roxana Vorniku King's College frameworks, I think you'll probably get the report. It's a long piece of work. Now, they have been doing a lot of work with the, on prison construction um, mm. and say it works there. Well, we'll see. <laughs> well, good. Afra, you look like you wanted to comment. What, what we have here, let, let us, let, let's be no doubt. What we have here is a deliberate dispersal of responsibility and management. Mm -hmm. in an effort to obfuscate the situation, to make it easier for these illegal and corrupt arrangements to thrive. My phrase for it is carefully crafted confusion. So in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, our main hotels are state-owned. The Trinidad Hilton, state-owned. Hilton operates it by dint of a management agreement. Mm -hmm. Hyatt Hotel, down on the waterfront, Hyatt Regency, state-owned, the building is state-owned, land and building. Okay. What used to be Tobago, Hilton, that is also state-owned. There's a new project being planned right now, I think it's Rockley Point in Tobago, 
that is going to be state owned. The interesting thing about all of that, because you may say, what is the point he's making? Apart from the uniqueness that we have the major hotels in the country owned by the state, because the private sector has actually not invested in hotels. They have not put out any capital, they have not borrowed any money and spent $100 million or $200 million putting out there. It's just not happened. The interesting thing about it, because this is a Caribbean corporate governance institute, and we're discussing lessons learned from off. The interesting thing about it from a governance yardstick is that in fact, those hotels are vested in different companies. So, Trinidad Hilton is vested in a company called eTech. Okay, evolving technologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. State owned. Tobago Hilton was also part of eTech. It failed. It's now come under something called uh, Magdalena Grand. It's also part of eTech. Company called Vanguard Limited. Hyatt Regency is Unicot, which is another company again, another ministry. And the new hotel in Tobago is yet another company. So in fact, it is like wicked two-year-olds. If you let them loose in the house and let them get into your fridge, they will make a mess. That is the quality of leadership we have. And we, we people in the seminar, people who are listening to this, colleagues who are listening, we need to engage with these things scientifically and thoroughly. So even a simple thing like the four or five major hotels in the country, each one is vested in a different company that is held under a different ministry. And it is purposely fragmented to avoid the sort of accountability, comparison, benchmarking, all of those phrases we'll be familiar with, to make sense of it all. It is very intentional, okay? And the hotel that is by the Savannah, the one that Dr. Rowley supposedly was dismissed from the cabinet in April 2008 about Napa Hotel. That's another ministry again, because that's smoke culture. You seen it? So, so what are we doing? <laughs> what are we really doing? These are, these are profound questions for us, to, for us to reflect on. As, as, as citizens in our own country, although we have um, colleagues from overseas sharing the seminar with us, okay? So the, the, the question then is, shouldn't all the uh, let's let's call it the all the 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 real estate infrastructure be managed by uh, a real estate management organization as a shared service of the government i mean it's something to think about and something to to have a conversation about um again i i don't i don't cast judgments i ask questions um um but 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 for me i mean when i was at city one of the things we did was all the all the um accounting was centralized in 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 a shared service the human resource not not the management but the administration was centralized the procurement was centralized and the and what what they call the um the facilities management was centralized so if you have a facilities management arm of the government that manages all the real estate it make it seems that to me that that's something that makes sense <clears throat> and and one has to make the case to to go that way whether it's a hotel or a or a government campus because it's it's infrastructure it's, it's and then one has the the right expertise geared towards negotiating the contracts with in the case of the hotels whoever the the hotel operator is but that kind of that level of conversation i think is important and then it goes back to purpose why are we how what what, what is the best way to manage this this um this this talk of 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 real estate uh, and and to ensure that we we get the the best value for money
I, I don't know if anybody has any comments, but. No, I, I think it's a common problem, isn't it? If you mm -hmm. have, uh, if you have state ownership of assets, how how do you manage that? But also, how mm -hmm. do you dive, how do you divest that uh, amongst mm -hmm. the different entities? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have, and if you open <clears throat> if you open it more widely to the private sector, how are you going to get the private sector to invest in the less attractive assets such as water distribution or maintenance of roads or sewerage within the within the country things where mm -hmm. there is there's been a lack of investment over decades really yep nigel if if i may comment um within the off report uh there was also a very clear um aspect of the findings where professor off uh spoke about the fact that although there would be contractual arrangements agreed to between the 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 construction company project manager and and the state sector um he commented that very often there was no uh, there appeared to be no real attempt to ensure that you hold the the um, contractors to um, what the terms of the agreement was. And he said, similarly, when government uh, in any way defaulted on their side, there seemed to be no rush on the part of the uh, contractors themselves to hold uh, government to account. And uh, to me, it, it seemed to suggest there was, and, and possibly still is to a great extent in the way in which we, we engage with each other in, in doing these projects. Um, there isn't a very clear position that these are my deliverables. And if I don't follow through, then there are consequences to that. Um, I am not sure if that is tied to some of the, the, the very points that were made by panelists earlier. One, is there even uh, a level of awareness as to what the purpose of what this project is for and therefore the benefit state and therefore what are the losses we face when some of those deliberals are not met? And secondly, the issue of awareness uh if if civil society is not engaged and, and and there isn't that real oversight and and both parties are not really they, they they're basically averse to holding each other to account then it it results in the, the kinds of situations that um the off report uh would have found because it, it was a range of different projects trinidad and tobago um, so the issue is, how do we address that? Wanting to ensure that both parties are held to performance standards and, and, and possibly ensuring that those performance standards are tied to what really is the purpose for which this project is being delivered? What are the benefits which the society is supposed to to get out of this? Can we begin to have national dialogue on these issues? Well, I think it, it, it comes back again to, 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 the, to the, the, the foundation for any good governance uh, purpose. And if one is not clear um, about, about whatever that purpose is and uh, the mechanisms to achieve it. And of course, the, the infrastructure around performance management and, and um, measuring and, and, and reporting with, with, with consequences, you, you, you don't get anywhere. I mean, it, it, those, are, those, are the, those are the foundational elements. Mm -hmm. 
and and I think the up report was was very clear again about 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 that transparency, um, being very clear about about purpose, and ensuring that you have that accountability um, mm -hmm. at at in in a way that that interested parties can can um, can get involved and and give and give the necessary feedback. Mm -hmm. If, okay. that, that thing about arrogance is also very clear. I mean, one has to have a certain amount of humility in the in the in the achievement of, of whatever that purpose is. Mm -hmm. Now th there was one other thing which Afra spoke about when he gave the context for the off report. And he mentioned that a lot of those projects occurred at a time when Trinidad and Tobago had plenty. So uh, we we weren't in the position we are in now, where um, government doesn't have enough money to spend on 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 projects and 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 it's not paying service providers and that kind of thing. But have we learned from that? And are we seeing so so? Afra, this question is is more directed to you, being here in Trinidad and Tobago. Are we seeing that in a time of crunch as we are now? that there is a difference in the behavior with respect to procurement practices in the construction sector? Well, no, I, I would say no, I agree. John, you opened with a very succinct and pointed <laughs> overview of the situation, yeah, post off. And I would have to say substantially, I agree with what John was saying. The answer is no. And the biggest example is Tobago Sandals. So we had some people come here. The fact that they were Caribbean people doesn't really matter. But we had some people come here, some adventurers, the Butch Stewart Sandals Resort International Group. And the bamboozle people. It's either the bamboozle people or our cabinet was in on it. But we signed an agreement, an MOU, to build a major hotel in Tobago with a thousand rooms. That was the most lopsided agreement in the history of hotel dam. So we were spending all the money to build a hotel to five star standard, to, to, to sandals design. We were fitting, we were finishing, we were outfitting. They had all the work permits. They could have given absolutely no employment to Trinidadians and Tobagoian citizens. There as many work permits as they wanted. That's written in the contract signed by Sham, Sham Joe who was the then Minister of Tourism, okay? That tax holidays, okay? That leveling of provisions, so anybody who comes after who gets a better contract, they will get that too. So I want what he's having, okay? All of that was in the contract. Hmm. They actually have provisions in the contract that identified and facilitated transfer pricing, okay? It's actually identified in the contract. That's how ridiculous it was. The minister of everything at the time, Stuart Young was talking about how he had hired an American law firm, White and Case, a prominent law firm from Wall Street. And White and Case is working on this and White and Case is working on that. And I asked White and Case, is there any case in the world where a country signed a contract to build a whole hotel for a resort Gave them all the employment, gave them all the taxes free. And what was in it for us? Our investment was for what? And if you ask any of them, they've never been able to give an explanation. What were the benefits going to be to the country? Sanders also had export provisions that they could have imported whatever they wanted for the hotel. If they wanted to import every drink, every fruit, <laughs> every particle of food, they could have imported it other duty-free provisions. So what was it in for us, apart from more punishment? So I don't think there's any much learning. And the, and the lack of a process, as, as I started off saying, and I, I return to this point as we approach the end, the lack of a process for needs assessment, what are we doing and why are we doing it, will leave us open to these sorts of adventurers all the time. So the prime minister of the country, Dr. Keith Rowley, his main, his main right-hand guy, Stuart Young, those are the two people promoting the scheme. At no point in time have either one of them been able to explain what it is that we signed. Why did we sign it? 
what were the benefits have since been abandoned and a good thing too for our for our national interest it's because my interest is not about pnm or unc my interest is the national interest it's a good thing it was abandoned so we have we have demonstrated a low capacity to learn and and we have to get out of that we have to behave like educated people and have show some conscience and some progress you know I thoroughly agree with uh, Afra, but I think the education has to be from the top down and from the bottom up at the same mm -hmm. time. Yep, yep, absolutely, um, John. I agree. And well, the Af report did speak to the importance of training. So, so training everyone <laughs> and, and clearly in a range of different areas as well, because if as Afra says, you know, the very first stage of the procurement cycle is to do your needs analysis and show that what it is you want, is it truly what you need? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So there's a lot of work for us to do, Nigel. In, in trying to build a culture of openness where information flows that much more easily and, and to bring a dialogue for, for there to be um, agreement among the, the, the population in terms of what are those large scale projects which bring value that, that the country would be willing to invest in and which are those that we really should uh, put aside, you know, and and um, and not waste uh, our our time, our resources, and 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 especially our money. Um, I see Robbie has uh, placed a, a comment saying interesting conversation. Robbie, I want to ask you because we're talking public procurement, and you're in Guyana, and and the Guyanese government at this time is really. Um, doing a lot of work in terms of infrastructural development, development of the country. So a lot of public procurement taking place. Uh, what are some of the issues and challenges you were seeing there? And, and has Guyana learned any of the lessons that Trinidad and Tobago ought to have learned, you know, if you've been able to follow the, the, the panel discussion so far? Good afternoon, everyone. I have been following at least 80% of it, unless when I get a call from my bosses and I stepped away. Um, but but the, the the fact remains that that procurement in in public sector has always been a controversial one. Mm -hmm. And I have to be very careful of what I'm seeing. <laughs> um, I'll be very careful. But but the fact is we we are trying to to take into consideration a lot of the lessons learned not only from trinidad but around the world but the, the reality is in 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 public procurement where politics is involved and, and they are dominant players um things might not always go as we ought them to be and you know, one of the questions what, what I just hear offer comments uh, about the, 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 the Hyatt. And some it, it reminds me I, I work with an international financial agency who usually gives loans to government for the con for construction purposes. And sometimes even those agencies who are supposed to be who have systems and policies in place, guidelines for the purpose of ensuring that they are value for money, transparency, accountability. Sometimes they themselves tends to waver and deviate from, from, from those ethics that they have. Uh, mm -hmm. Afro made mention of Hyatt, who, who were the contractor, which country they were from. A US firm was employed a US law firm was employed for some sorts of litigation. Now, the America is one of the company that's, uh, one of the country that supposedly advocate for, for corruption and, uh, about, 
and advocate for corruption, and they have so many anti-corruption watchdog agencies and all these places. But what have happened to these companies if, the, if a project, a, a public project was determined to be um, of a corrupt nature, right? Some of these financial institutions that gives the money for this or this project are headquartered in the United States of America, all right? Um, so I, it, you know, I mean, I, I can't say exactly what some of how I feel about public procurement, um, but I, I do believe uh, of some of the comments that I were able to follow the conversations about um, feasibility study, impact assessment, the environmental and social impact risk assessment. Those things are needed. Um, um, and for most of what has been happening here, we are trying to ensure that all, all of that are available. But there are sometimes, it, it still wavers. And it wavers because of public interest. All right? Um, sometimes even the players, the, the, the forms that are, that, are, that are involved in some of these contracts, major contracts around the world, are owned by American companies. All right, and, and, and you will find that when, for example, you will find if a Chinese company gets, gets that, that, uh, that Chinese company, the, the same mechanism is employed for the Chinese and the American company, the same sentiments are expressed, but the American will soon to put a, 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 the Chinese company in a dark hole, but it is not the same standard for it. So the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that some of the people who are supposed to hold us accountable, who are supposed to ensure transparency, accountability, value for money, fit for purpose. Sometimes those are the people that fails us, and that's why they gave country like us, small third world developing countries, the leverage to do what we do. I mean, there is so much I can say, but I, I, I don't want to. I mean, the panel have been excellent for most I have been following, but. Um, I have been involved in public procurement for all my life. I started at the tender age of 17. I have hold, hold several high positions in procurement um, in international agencies. And I can tell you some of the, the things that you have to do to make it happen. You have a financial agreement for, 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 for five, a project for five years. And for some reason, the back and forth, you have to turn a blind eye into something in order to reach that deadline. Right to, to make it so it, it, it's I, I I don't see we ever um, eradicating or even to bring it to a degree or a percentage or um, a minimal percentage of corruption. There are there are countries that, that lobbyists are legal, and in my humble opinion, that's a big form of, of corruption. <clears throat> All right. So um, that's, that's a, a bit of piece that I would like to add to this conversation for now. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Any other perspectives before we wrap up? Yeah, we are into the last 15 minutes of yep. uh, today's panel discussion. So. If there are no more comments or questions or anything, and I'm not seeing anything coming up in the chat, Nigel. No, uh, no. Maybe you can ask. No, but, no, why, why, why don't I ask? Um, let's go in reverse order. Afra, you, you first, then Michael, then John. Okay, well, I would like to say, Nigel and uh, Kamala, first of all, thank you for hosting this important seminar. And thank you for inviting me to speak. If I could, if I could put forward some respectful suggestions, and I'm remaining focused on the off okay. report. There are three suggestions I would like to place here in, in conclusion. The first thing is that the collected proceedings of the off report have been evacuated from the public record. I have them. Not to any subterfuge or anything, but when everybody thought we were just looking, some of us were saving because mm -hmm. I don't trust them. 
and I was right not to trust him. Same thing with Coleman. They evacuated the website. I have that too because I don't trust him. Okay. I would like to propose, I'm doing it in an open forum, no subterfuge with me. I would like to propose to the colleagues of CCGI that you all make a formal proposal to UE that the of proceedings should be stored at UE's library and available for scholars because it covers a wide areas of scholarship, political science, law, economics, management. Mariana Brown often participates in these seminars. I wonder where he is today. Engineering, planning, surveying, architecture. It covers a trip. Accounting is at is that UV Niger. You did accounting at UV. These are all mm -hmm. things that emerge out of the learning of, of, but you don't get the fullness of it if you don't have the proceedings. Look at the beautiful session we had today, just talking about the report. The proceedings are vast trove of knowledge. I have it, but I need institutional backing for us to put it in, a, in an institution where it can achieve longevity and accessibility. That's my first call. CCGI mm -hmm. comrades. Do your part. I did my part. I saved it when everybody was just watching TV. I saved it. Do your part. Second point. Again, CCGI, I, want, I would like you to use your letterhead and your, and, your, and, your, and your influence. Write to the new principle of UE. And let us start using this material, which covers these areas of, of learning, in lecturing postgraduate courses and those things. You mustn't just sit down with a dead letter in the library. OK? Let, let's start using the material out of the off report. So two out of three is not bad. I got two out of three things related to off. And the last one, of course, they said in chamber, said two out of every three dollars was stolen or wasted. So two out of three has a funny provenance in Trinidad and Tobago. But we continue. The third point really is that I would like to, to, to seek to lobby for CCGI to join me in calling for the procurement law to be proclaimed. Yeah, those are my closing remarks. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Michael? So Michael's video is off. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, Michael. Yeah. Uh, I, um, well, thank you very much for having uh, invited me to participate. I feel um, humbled and also anxious, nervous about uh, dipping my toe in um, politics of Trinidad or, um, or or the Caribbean more broadly, or frankly, anywhere. Um, <laughs> um, I'm just a humble lawyer, teacher, litigator. Um, I think what I would say is this, and I, you know, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think you know, what I would say is that, you know, you've got a, you know, we, we, we could have another happy three hours debating how the legislation which is on the statute book in Trinidad could be improved and we could have all sorts of fun but you know it's there get it working and then come back in five years and see right okay what's worked and what hasn't I be dispirited if it doesn't deliver all that you think it might deliver is will be my first message but I think if the emphasis is on transparency and enabling people to investigate and to and to prevent dodgy deals being done in the dark and to and to provide some additional transparency to the whole process then it will at least be one or two steps forward even if it isn't the great the great giant leap that you might Im immediately hope for thank you very much i agree with you 100 percent John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kamala. And thank you to the audience. Uh, the invitation to speak was much appreciated. And thank you to my co-panelists, Michael Boucher and Afra Raymond. It's been uh, a very enjoyable couple of hours spent with you. What I would like people to take away today is that change isn't an immediate thing. It requires work. It requires a voice. The more people who become involved, the stronger the voice is. You do have to take baby steps. 
And a way to develop it is to show people the value in each little step that is taken. And I think I've spoken a lot about education and the need for education. A change in education can bring about cultural change as well. And if it's started in high school and in the universities and through the good work of CCGI and other bodies and through AFRA, change will come about. Hopefully, if we have another one of these in next year, the year after, we will see the baby steps happening. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, and let me thank each of you for taking the time to share your perspectives, your thoughts on a very um, important and very informative um, part of our history in, 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 the, in the work that is the off report. Um, again, I believe that the fundamentals are where you have to start. Uh, purpose, uh, transparency, and definitely um, a ton of humility. Uh, being very clear about what one is trying to achieve and, and to be open and, 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 and honest about how one is trying to, to do so. Um, and if, if he can, if he can make any progress along that spectrum, I think he will have improved in some little, little way. I believe that the, the legislation is only part of what is required and, and in the institutions in which I serve, we very clearly have that purpose. As, as the at, at the forefront of whatever we do and ensure that how we do it is, is very open and transparent um, and and we do our part in operating in that fashion to to ensure we deliver value for money um, I'd like to thank uh, all those who attended um, we had quite a a good turnout and I look forward to the to the next session so but I'll, with that said come I hand it over to you to, to wrap up thank you very much Eman um and, and may I start by thanking you Nigel you know for your leadership as, as chair of CCGI it, it it's really um a strong force that has helped us to be able to focus on our purpose on building the space and having these kinds of uh, dialogue in the region I'd like to add my thanks to Afra Michael and Jaws um John Dows so forgive me John <laughs> and um in his absence I want to also say a very sincere thanks to Professor uh John Off um you know he he does not know me from Adam and um still he responded to my email request asking that he participate in this um, session. And while he was not able to, he very generously recommended Michael Bowser. And, and Michael, we are so grateful that you are also not knowing us and not having done any work here in Trinidad and Tobago, agreed to come and share some of your thoughts and so. Um, and I wanted to say, Afro, that your, your, your three um, requests are noted. <laughs> Uh, some of which I can act on, and uh, as soon as I, I can, you know, we would get moving in, in that direction. But I want to um, say thanks to everyone and also to share um, the comment that was placed by Lydia Alexander in, in the chat, you know. Um, part of the change that we need to see happen it has to come from, from those who are learning and understanding the importance of all of this. So 
Lydia, thank you for your comment. I agree with you where you say, I believe SIPS students and procurement professionals need to hear this discussion. It was extremely insightful and clearly shows that we have a lot to do. Thank you very much, Lydia. I want to ask all of you though, please make sure you click on the link just above Lydia's comment. Give us your formal feedback on today's session. It's important to us that we get that very honest evaluation from you that tells you uh, how we are doing things here at CCGI so that we can ensure we improve as we go along. Thank you all very much. It has been a very stimulating three hours. I wish there is so much more that we can do because this is such an important area that impacts all of our lives. But it's the start. So our procurement series will continue this year. Uh, among the topics we would also look at is uh, inviting some of those state sectors where they have already started implementing the practices that goes in alignment with the Pro Procurement Act. So there's a lot for us to look forward to. This is a busy week for us, so I remind you, Dr. Maryam Abdul-Richards will be um, headlining CCGI's conversations with, and she'd be looking at managing in a disruption this Thursday from 12.30. And on Friday, we have the effective uh, audit committee workshop that will be facilitated by the former head of global um, IIA, Janita John from South Africa. So please pass on the word and I look forward to all of you joining us again. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Bye-bye.